Right, so welcome members to the 27th meeting in 2014 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and ask members and indeed everybody else in the room to make sure you've turned off your mobile phone, please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed that we take items nine and 11 in private. Item nine allows for further consideration of the oral evidence we will receive today on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. It's also suggested we take future stage one consideration of the bill in private. Item 11 is consideration of a draft report on instruments considered by the committee in 2013-14. Does the committee agree to take items 9 and 11 in private, please? Thank you. Does the committee also agree to take further consideration of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill at Stage 1 in private? Thank you. Thank you. Members should also note that in line with the previous decision of the committee, item 10 will also be taken in private. Agenda item 2 is the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. And our first agenda item today is oral evidence on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. This session allows the committee to follow up on matters that it previously raised in writing with the Scottish Government in relation to this bill. And I welcome the uh, first panel of the cast of thousands for today. Uh, Ian Turner, who's the bill team leader. Good morning. Uh, Norman MacLeod, who's Scottish Government Legal Directorate. And also Rachel Rayner from the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Uh, Dave Thompson, yes. Um, from the Land Reform and Tenancy Union, Dr. Amanda Fox, Food and Drink Policy Lead. Good morning. Uh, and Anna-Marie Conlong from the Performance Unit. Good morning, one and all. I hope we will test you a great deal this morning. I also hope we won't take absolutely forever because we've got lots of lawyers that are here to hear from later. Um, and that takes me to the appropriate sheet and questions which I think will be started by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, convener. Um, can I uh, start uh, by looking at uh, how the government and parliament work uh, in determining what the uh, objectives uh, in relation to national outcomes are? And before, ah, <laughs> I thought it wasn't on. <laughs> So I'll just say that again. Um, I, w I want to just look at how the legislation provides for uh, what the national outcomes are and what role Parliament has in uh, seeing whether they're met. And before I ask my questions, I'm just going to go back to the progenitor of the Scotland's outcomes, which is, of course, the uh, Virginia Performance Model. Um, and in particular, uh, I want to explore with perhaps... Uh, uh, Mr. Turner and uh, Ms. Gonlong, uh, the extent to which we've looked at uh, the Virginia performance model, because it differs in some particular ways from the way that uh, it's constructed as a bill here, in that the uh, Council on Virginia's future, which essentially determines what the targets are, uh, is one that is not simply a government body, but specifically, for example, requires uh, that the majority and minority leaders uh, from each house are part of the council that sets the targets. Therefore, there is, in their context, a role for a much more widely based, not simply government-driven, uh, setting uh, of the targets. And I just wondered to what extent, perhaps in the first ca case, uh, officials and indeed ministers perhaps have looked at uh, the Virginia performs model and the Council of Virginia's future in particular uh, in deciding how they want to take this forward. Um, I'm happy to take that obviously. Um, yes, I mean back in 2007 and before that when Scotland performs was being developed there was a huge amount of kind of research and liaison um, with the people involved in Virginia Performs and obviously a lot of what has happened there did inform Scotland Performs and, and lead across but you're absolutely right that the key difference is around the Council on Virginia's future. What I would say, um, where that brings us to the difference between there and what we're currently proposing um, and the provisions is currently laid out, the Scottish Government believes here that the situation that we've laid out in the provision reflects the current separation of powers between the Scottish Government and the Parliament. Therefore, it would be for the Scottish Ministers to coordinate government business, set out the strategic direction for government, but of course within their overall accountability to Parliament. 
and Parliament would also exercise the scrutiny function, holding ministers to account on progress towards the national outcomes and objectives. Now, of course, the Scottish Parliament may wish to debate on the national outcomes as set by Scottish ministers, and the arrangements proposed wouldn't prevent that in, in any way whatsoever. And just to pick up on your point about the kind of widely based um, element of the, the outcomes in Virginia's, Virginia performs, part of the work that we are doing under Mr Swinney and the round table chaired by him, which is a, a, a quite diverse group of stakeholders, it includes cross-party support from the Parliament and also key civic organisations in Scotland, such as the Carnegie Trust and Oxfam Scotland, as well as some academics. That group is working together to develop and improve Scotland performance, and in fact, that's where the impetus to put provisions in the, the Community Empowerment Bill came from. So the national outcomes and development, they would be widely consulted upon. And in fact, within the provisions, we, we've left the basis for that consultation as open as possible, so that as many people as possible, including the whole of the, public's of, the whole of the public of Scotland, where that's appropriate, would be consulted upon. So there is that broad base for setting the national outcomes. But yep, the fundamental difference is that the council in Virginia performs, as you see, that's quite separate, quite different from what's, what we are proposing in the bill. But however, we'd be more than welcome to take the views of the committee on the respective roles of the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Government in setting these outcomes um, and to take that back for further consideration with ministers. Uh, can I just say this committee's role is more restricted, perhaps, uh -huh. than looking at the broader policy issues. It's yeah. simply about you know, whether the construction that's yes. before us uh, is appropriate and the policy committee yes. would perhaps pick up some of the points that you're, you're making. So I'm simply just trying to explore uh -huh. the process to make sure that what we have in the bill uh -huh. properly reflects the policy outcome. Because I do note um, that the Virginia Performance Framework and the Council uh -huh. is something that is established not by ministerial fiat, yes. but by the governing legislation that's been uh -huh. passed in Virginia. Uh -huh. And all I really want to just be clear is uh -huh. that that is forming part of the consideration. And I think from the answer that I've had that we should properly as a committee conclude that it has been, uh -huh. even if in policy terms elsewhere, there might be a difference in view as to what yes. uh, sense should be, uh, should be uh, taken of that. Now, uh, perhaps looking at uh, the specific provisions, um, the bill itself makes no specific provisions uh, as to persons or bodies that should be consulted about oh, national yes. outcomes. Um, now, it would seem that you would be able to identify uh, particular bodies that we consult. Is there any particular reason why we're not seeing a list in the bill? The, the, the intention behind that is to leave the potential scope for consultation as, as broad as possible, and this is something that our stakeholders have been very keen on. Um, in some cases, a review of the, the national outcomes might focus on a very specialist, a sp specific issue, in which case only certain bodies or persons would be consulted because that would be the most appropriate thing to do. Obviously, in other cases, the consultation might be much wider if the consultation or the review of the outcomes is of a much more general nature. So really, the intention behind this and not listing a body was not to limit it or narrow in any way the scope of those bodies and people who could be consulted. But again, if the committee did feel that there was a, a minimum list that should be included, again, we could go away and consider that. But we would be very clear that we wouldn't want that to, to limit the scope of potential consultation in any future review. Um, I don't think it would be for this committee to suggest what would mm -hmm. be on the list or not. That would be, a, again, a policy matter. Um, but I, th I think the, 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 the point I just want to be clear about is whether it is consideration is properly being given to whether there are some people or bodies who should be involved in looking at the whole thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but in ensuring that the, the bill does not restrict consultation yes. to that. And that is, I think, from the nodding head I'm getting at the other end of the table, 
exactly the yes. consultation that, 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 that's taken place. Yes. Right, let me just uh, move on to reporting, because uh -huh. the bill provides for no uh, particular provision uh, for regular periods of reporting, unless I'm misreading it. Is there that's any correct. particular reason why that's the case? Again, this was to, to keep some flexibility. The situation that we have at the moment is that the Scotland Performs website is the reporting tool for the national outcomes. And that is quite unique and in that the website is constantly updated. Updates are constantly yeah. made um, as, as soon as, as new data becomes available. And we have had debates, again, this might be more of a policy matter, but we have had debates with our colleagues in the round table around whether it would be helpful and how much value a static reporting time adds to that reporting process. So that is definitely something that is still under consideration, is how we could maintain that constant dynamic reporting of Scotland Performs, but also provide some other form of regular reporting if there's an appetite for that, and that is something that is still under consideration. Um, and again, in formulating the policy, we've got a situation in what's drafted um, that public bodies beyond government have to would have a duty to have regard to the outcome yes. set, but this is not a duty placed on the government itself. Uh, in drafting this, was there any particular reason why, if you like, now let me just let me just characterise this in the most extreme way possible. The government gets to choose the questions in the exam sheet and then answers them, but that's not the case for other public bodies. I would, well, I would assume that the, the questions are set the role of scrutiny in the Scottish Parliament that's holding the, the government to account on the national outcomes and if those outcomes have been set on that very broad basis based on public and civic consultation then it's it's a collective view of what the national outcome should be and it is then progress against that that is tested on that wide consultative basis uh, perhaps I'll just allow others to come in with a final question. Okay. Um, the body that the Cabinet Secretary has brought together, the government has brought together, uh, including opposition uh, representatives, but there isn't, in fact, directly a parliamentary. Mm -hmm. so, so we've got a whole range of bodies and individuals representing a range of political views, but there is no process within the bill for Parliament to be part of that. Mm -hmm. That's correct? That's correct at right. the moment. Okay, it's stands. important just we understand that and we get that in the record. Convener. Th thank you very much. Can I, can I just pursue that though? Because if this is some kind of framework with which other people, to which other people have to have regard, and I take your, your initial comment that this is subject to parliamentary scrutiny, as one would expect in a parliamentary democracy, then it seems strange that there's no mechanism for the government to bring this to Parliament in the form, perhaps, of an affirmative statutory instrument setting out the principles, which we could consider, reject or approve. Um, I'm struggling to see why there's no such process. As I say, the, the position up until now has just been that the provisions that have been laid out have reflected the Scottish Government view of the separation of powers between scrutiny and setting the strategic direction for government. That has been the thinking up to now around that separation of powers. But as I say, we welcome the views of committee and we can go back and consider that further with yeah, ministers. Okay. I think what I would argue is that we will always scrutinise things, but we've got to find them before we can scrutinise them. Uh, if the government doesn't set it out in any form that a parliamentary committee can actually get its teeth into, then it's not going to be scrutinised other than peripherally, well, which is at, not really a good process. Well, at the moment, Scotland Performs is set out publicly. Everything is publicly available. All of the information is publicly mm -hmm. available. And in fact, both last year and this year, we have assisted parliamentary committees in scrutiny of the draft budget by specifically producing performance scorecards for each yeah. of the, the committees. So there are, you know, there are processes there, yes, albeit not laid out in a, in a formal statute, but Scotland performs as publicly available, and that information has been used very well by the Parliament to scrutinise performance. Yeah, OK. At, at the risk of pursuing this too far, can I just make the point that if, within the law, there is something set out which public bodies have to have regard to, uh -huh. then I would suggest that that set of things to which they have to have regard ought to be laid out in such a way that a parliamentary committee, ours or others, 
could specifically scrutinise them. Okay. Rather than having to work the way around and to generate some debate about the general yes. principles we think we have when these things are actually in law for others to consider. There seems to be a process point there, that, which I think is what worries us. Okay, thank you. I'm certainly happy to take that back, obviously. Okay, thank you. I think that completes that section, unless others have questions on that, which I think takes me forward to what we have as question five and John Scott. Thank you. Um, sections four, six, eight, three, sixteen, two, and 3 and 51, 2 are all broadly concerned with the procedure to be applied to powers which enable bodies to be added to or removed from the list in the schedules of the bill. In the bill, the power to both add or remove a body is subject to the negative procedure. In that regard, we draw a parallel with the Freedom of Information in Scotland Act 2000. More recent acts, however, have taken a different approach to the power to add a body subject to the affirmative procedure and the removal of a body subject to the negative procedure. For example, both the Public Service Reform Scotland Act 2010 and the Regulatory Reform Scotland Act 2014 have taken this approach. Why have you not adopted this more recent approach? And why in particular have you chosen to apply the negative and not the affirmative procedure to the power to add a body to a list? <coughs> that will be for me. The Powers provide flexibility to make changes um, should it be necessary. The powers themselves in those um, provisions um, across the bill are limited to amending the list of public bodies which can be involved. The time we put forward the regulations, we believe that it would be unlikely to generate any controversy. It's unlikely to be a particular issue at those stages. Therefore, the negative procedure would be the more appropriate procedure to use at that point. Right. It's, it, we would be happy to consider the. I appreciate the points about um, more recent acts, and we'd be happy well, to consider the views of the committee. Well, I, I mean, I think that would be our view. Why should there be a sudden reduction of of, of standards, as it were? But uh, I, I'm just I'm happy to make the point. I'm happy with your answer. I'll leave it at that for others to come in if they want to see more. I would suggest that the point is well made, but the, I suspect the problem is unless you know really which ones you're referring to, it's not quite so obvious which process you'd actually necessarily want. I, I suppose we would tend to give the government the benefit of the doubt that you would consult on things that needed to be consulted on, and therefore you wouldn't bring a negative instrument if you hadn't consulted the appropriate people. Absolutely. I think some sense on this, and therefore in, in practice the procedures might be almost the same. Yes, I, I think that is our view. Um, the whole bill has gone through a hugely consultative process um, with different ex parte consultation and, and then a more detailed consultation on the draft bill and that's kind of what we intend to do in regulations going forward. Yeah, I suspect we've, we've made, made the point and perhaps that's all we're going to for the moment. I suppose as parliamentarians we just um, to want to see a reduction in parliamentary scrutiny and both of these answers suggest a reduction in parliamentary scrutiny which is a departure from what we've been used to. Would that be fair comment? I, I, it's still negative procedure. It's still not. It's a reduction over a affirmative procedure, certainly, but um, it's probably appropriate, we believe, for those powers as they stand at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, John. Right, I think that brings us to Stuart McMillan, please. Good morning, panel. Um, just it's regarding the Section 10 uh, of the Bill, um, now, there's a possibility that, uh, that, that questions may stray into policy matters, which I clearly understand that uh, you wouldn't be able to, to answer. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll pose a question, then we'll take it from there. Um, Section 10 of the Bill <coughs> excuse me, uh, provides that, uh, that community planning partnerships and partners uh, must carry out their functions in relation to community planning in accordance with any relevant guidance issued by Scottish ministers. Uh, so, in terms of the guidance, why is the guidance under Section 10 proposed to be binding uh, on community planning partnerships and partners, rather uh, than there being a requirement that they will actually have any regard to it? Yeah, this is this has become an important point um, during the process as we develop mm -hmm. the bill. The intention is that this section would be used for community planning partnerships, which have been in place for a number of years, but we're putting them on a statutory footing in this bill. Is that this section will ensure a consistency of approach to community planning across Scotland. And there may be some, while we 
want local discretion, we want local innovation in how they approach it and how they deal with it. There may be some matters which we feel are kind of fundamental enough um, that they should apply on a national level and hence the reason to comply with national guidance. Uh, <clears throat> I, I sit on the, on the local government uh, committee, yes. um, as you're aware, as we met last week. Yes. <laughs> and the, um, certainly over the last few years, uh, much of the work that's been undertaken in the committee uh, has certainly uh, highlighted that particular point regarding community planning partnerships um, and much of the community face work that we have undertaken um, has highlighted uh, based at the start differences in the public understanding, public knowledge of community planning partnerships. Uh, but at the same time, um, one of the, the key issues that has been raised time and time again has been the issue of, uh, of the, the perception of, kind of top down uh, whereby the government imposing, the government of whichever hue imposing uh, restrictions upon local government, upon uh, community planning partnerships. Um, so in, in terms of this particular section, um, was there a, what really was the, the, the thinking behind, not so much about putting it, the community planning partnerships into statute, but what was the thinking um, behind the, kind of what's proposed here in this particular section? in terms of the guidance? The community planning part of the bill, in it feels a bit top-down in the bill because it places duties on the statutory partners. You can't place duties on um, kind of voluntary bodies or community bodies in that way. Mm. So the statute does have a bit of a feeling of a kind of a top-down approach, um, whereas actually what we're trying to do is put those duties on to make sure that they ensure that community bodies do participate, that they resource that process properly. And there may be processes within that if... If there is good practice emerging, if there is best practice emerging, that we want to see that actually being actively <coughs> promoted and encouraged, as you heard about in the committee last week, to some extent it's a culture change as well within public sector bodies about how they engage and get community bodies to participate. And we think the guidance can actually help with that process of culture change in that way. Uh, but could some of this culture change and some of these uh, methods actually not uh, happen through other routes? Such Absolutely. As through the benchmarking tool that COSL have... Absolutely. This doesn't rule out those ones as well. It's just in addition to those. Okay, thank you. Um, so, in terms of the actual, in terms of this particular power, how do you foresee this power actually being utilised? It's hard to know at the moment because I think, along with the, as I talked about in the last question, the guidance will be subject to quite a, a lot of consultation before we put it out. It will be consultation with the public sector bodies, it will be consultation with community bodies and all the interested partners we've had throughout the bill process. So it's hard to say what particular provisions we will use this for. I think it will emerge from that process about if we use it, this is what we'll use it for. Uh, is there an opportunity for Parliament to actually be involved in that particular uh, consultative process and for, for Parliament to have an opportunity to actually discuss any guidance? Uh, there's always an opportunity for Parliament to discuss. There's not any specific provision in the section mm. at the moment, and we're aware of that, and I'm certainly happy to consider if mm. the committee would want to um, include that within a provision. Would you consider it uh, an appropriate use of uh, parliamentary time to consider the use of guidance or, uh, or scrutiny? It would depend, I think, sometimes on the guidance. Sometimes it may go into a lot of detail. And it may not necessarily be you want a negative procedure, it may not be you want an affirmative procedure, you may want just the guidance to be laid before you or something like that. Mm -hmm. It might not necessarily be the kind of process as set. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Right, that brings us to Mike McMinzer. Please. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, the new section 97C uh, Part 3A of the 2003 Act provides that eligible land does not include land on which there is a building or structure that is an individual's home, other than the buildings or structures that may be set out in regulations by ministers. It appears, therefore, that ministers may make regulations which have the effect of applying the provisions of the new Part 3A to buildings or structures which constitute an individual's home. Can you explain in more detail why you have taken this power? Um, in your response to written questions in this matter, you suggest <coughs> that it's to allow for flexibility. What other factors did you take into account when taking this power? So me, um, the flexibility in the, on these powers is the, the key part in that at the moment. I mean, clearly the 
the policy intent of it is not to take people's homes away from in these circumstances, but yet still allow community bodies to take control of assets. And essentially, the the powers that we're looking to, to take on in this is simply to allow that flexibility to to put in detail the types of, of buildings or assets that can be included or excluded in this. At, at this moment, we don't have specific examples, um, hence the, the, the need for the flexibility in the and the powers at the moment. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you appreciate the need mm -hmm. to get this right, yeah. though, in terms oh, of absolutely. there will be lawyers across the country scratching their head and hanging on their every word on this, I suspect. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's a wee bit disappointing that you haven't got to a stage and you're thinking where you are able to provide uh, more detail. Yeah. Um, OK, I'll, 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 I'll move on, though. Um, when previously asked to justify the width of the power in the new section, 97E Part 4 of the Land Reform Scotland Act 2003, the government cited examples of similar powers in Section 1 and 2 of the Transport and Work Scotland Act 2007. However, the connection between these powers and the powers in Section 97E4 is not wholly apparent mm. to the committee. Can you shed a bit of light on that? Yeah, I mean, the, the connection between the two is largely in terms of process. I mean, perhaps Rachel will better explain the, the legal connections between the um, the, just, just going to, if I just maybe take you quickly through the, the example of the power in the Transport and Works um, Act, uh, Transport and Works Scotland Act 2007, the section one gives ministers a power to make an order relating to or for matters connected with constru construction of transport systems or inland waterways. And then section two goes on to set out the sort of matters about which provision can be made in such an order and in the schedule that makes it clear that this includes compulsory acquisition of land and then uh, section uh, two goes on to provide that you know, the, the order that ministers can make can apply modify or exclude enactments which you know, relate to those matters so um, that's used as an example because the power we've we're proposing in section 97e would enable provision for ministers to make a process for acquiring land and this could be done by modifying existing processes for compulsory acquisition if that was thought to be an appropriate way of of um, achieving what is wanted the aim of taking the power is to ensure that where ministers do have the power to compulsory acquire land. There can be a, a, a process for this and it can be fair and robust and open and transparent. And um, the detail in, um, in that you're asking about is just a means of making this happen um, and, and just provide, in, rather than maybe necessarily writing out longhand a process, you could apply um, existing legislation but modify it to suit the particular purpose. Sure. I mean, I'm glad you're talking about modification because I'm quite sure you're aware that the, you know, the, um, the provisions that were in, in existence uh, are, are not without their problems. Um, but can you explain how um, you can justify the width of the power um, in Section 97E4? Then, I mean, you've, I, I understand um, it makes sense, or would apparently make sense to, to, you know, to use something that works reasonably, I suppose, in practice. How can you justify the width of the power? I think it's to ensure that uh, the power is wide enough that the process that we would need to put in place should this happen can be fair, transparent and, and robust. Um, if, if you think, if you have concerns about the power, we're happy to, to consider those. And subject to parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and subject to parliamentary scrutiny, that is subject to the affirmative procedure. Mm. OK, right, thank you. Um, and could you also explain uh, um, or, or give an explanation as to why the power in section 97E4 um, is drawn in such wide terms? I mean, has there been any consideration given to restricting this power? Um, I think that's something we'd be happy to, to take away and consider further if there are particular concerns. Uh, the power can only be used in limited circumstances in that uh, set out you know, where ministers have the power to compulsorily acquire the land. So the regulations aren't setting out when ministers can acquire land. They are just setting out the process for 
where that power is being exercised to ensure that you know, the, um, the process is transparent and fair and includes the appropriate detail. Okay, thank you. And um, can you provide examples of the kinds of modifications to primary legislation that the Scottish Government anticipates making in exercise of this power as permitted by the provision in section 97E5? Um, we don't we don't have any examples um, at the moment other than it would give us the opportunity to use other um, existing um, schemes for compulsory acquisition and modify and apply them if that was thought to be the most appropriate um, for for this particular power. Okay, I'm sure you appreciate that some of this is going to be quite contentious and, and although that, that, that's a policy matter, I think there's an interlinking here between policy and, and the work of this committee that's really quite crucial to the successful operation of the of the of the Bill of Act when it becomes an act. But thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Convener, can I just go back to question eight, which is linked, I suppose, to this and I'm disappointed that you don't have notwithstanding the, the powers you're assuming, which are certainly massive, uh, we've no idea of what sort of assets um that you would be considering um would be eligible for um, mm. compulsory purchase. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think at this stage... Can you, can you try a little harder to give us... And I, and I should, of course, <laughs> declare an interest as a landowner and as a farmer, mm -hmm. and therefore this is quite specifically interesting to me, but certainly to many others as well. Yeah. I mean, I think at this stage, again, going back to the flexibility point, it is to allow us to, to, to ensure that, as I said at the beginning, homes of, you know, persons home is not going to get taken off them, for example. Land that is currently being used is not going to get taken off them. The, the width of the powers, at the moment, one of the, the, the changes in, in the bill is the, the fact that the Land Reform Act will now apply to an urban situation as well as rural, and that brings with it a whole different set of considerations that need to be taken. And what we are, are considering at the moment is a way to ensure that what we put in the bill can cover both urban and rural. I mean, as you appreciate, the two completely different beasts in terms of assets. Um, and the bottom line is we want to make sure we get it right. Um, which hence the need for the flexibility at this stage until we've, we've, we've managed to narrow down the, the, the sort of buildings that, and assets and land, etc., that we would like to include or exclude from this. And at this moment, certainly not homes, certainly not land that is you know, constructed being used. I mean, the, the whole basis of it is, is to ensure that you get the sustainable development of land. Um, and if a community purchase of a particular asset or a piece of land helps that, then that's, that's what we'd like to include. And if it's, if it's simply a, a means to, to acquire without any particular means to sustainable development of land, then that's not something we'd be interested in. That's why we're still considering it at the moment. And I can't give you any more specific examples, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. um, I could just add that, um, obviously, any regulations that ministers made would have to comply with the Convention on Human Rights. And, and as, as, as you will be aware, that Article 8 provides a right to respect for uh, private and family life, and that um, can include uh, rights to respect for home. So that is something that would have to be taken into account you know, if that power were to be used. And mm. that is something we're obviously yeah. aware of. That was my next question. Was it going to be ECHR compliant? Because the recent history in this committee has been with um, a problem with the, the 1993 Act, and I noticed that you use the word um, constantly, a process of transparency and fairness, and uh, that turned that Europe, that was it Supreme Court judgment turned on the fact that it wasn't fair to both parties. So I would trust that this legislation will endeavour to be fair to all sides, otherwise we will find ourselves back in the position of making legislation again, which is uh, knocked down subsequently. Just to observe, thank you, thank you for the answers. I mean, can I just observe that we're looking again at a piece of legislation which is fairly wide ranging, which has fairly wide powers, and officials like yourselves come along and, and, and absolutely rightly, in perfectly good faith, of course, tell us that there's no intention of doing this, 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 and this, which we understand. And that's undoubtedly what government wants. But the once upon a time was a principle that you only legislated for what you wanted uh, and that the man in the street was defended against misuse of power because government was never given it. 
we increasingly seem to be looking at legislation where government has very wide powers and, and Parliament is having to trust government, which is not difficult to do, having to trust government not to abuse those powers. Um, now, I'm conscious, of course, that the, the specific purpose of everything is in the top line of the bill and you couldn't use any of the purposes, any of the powers underneath it for a purpose that wasn't uh, within the purpose of the bill. But nonetheless, I get the impression that increasingly we're looking at bills that are just widening the scope of what government has within its discretion. And as a part of me, as a parliamentarian, is actually just slightly worried about that trend. But that's uh, not your problem as officials, of course. Grateful to you for your answers. And I think uh, we now go to a point of detail with Stuart Stevenson. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Kim Fira. I want to explore um, the use of the word prescribed in uh, the section 97 November. Uh, which is going to be inserted by the operation of section 48 in the, in the bill. Um, section 98 of the Land Reform Bill uh, says that prescribed is intended to mean prescribed by regulations made by ministers. However, when we look at uh, <coughs> 97N that's to be inserted, um, it uses the word prescribed in a number of occasions, in particular in subsection 1, ministers may by regulation make provision for or in connection with prohibiting during the prescribed period prescribed persons from transferring, etc. Is that implying, because it's not clear in the written answers we've got, that prescribed period prescribed persons are therefore subject to the definition in section 98 and therefore will have to be done through uh, secondary legislation who the prescribed, what the prescribed period and prescribed persons are? Um, perhaps I can help you with that. Yes, uh, we agree that uh, prescribed will mean prescribed in regulations made by ministers and that that is what is intended in section 97N. Um, the use of prescribed um, in, that you've given are, will definitely be in regulations. Um, the provision that you read out the whole it is a regulation power ministers may make regulations and then what it is saying is that those regulations may set out the period for which the restriction on the transfer of land may apply they may set out they can, may set out who can be restricted from transferring the land and so um yes it is they are matters that will be in regulations and the they will be in regulations under section 97n uh, subsection 1 or subsection 3, and both of those attract the affirmative procedure. And in uh, uh, subsection 2b, we talk about prescribed persons in prescribed circumstances. I think that there is, and in 2c, there's prescribed circumstances, prescribed information, and in subsection 3, prescribed period. And in subsection 4, prescribed circumstances. <coughs> so you're confirming that in each and every instance, in the inserted 97N, the use of the word prescribed is as described in the existing section 98 of the Act. Yes. Um, you know, for example, in subsection 2, that is setting out uh, further detail of the regulations that may be made under subsection 1. So, yes, and the same applies for um, subsection 4, which is making details about the provisions that may be made in regulations under subsection 3. So, yes, um, those examples you confirm, they will be matters in regulations. But subsection 3 uses the word prescribed without making backwards reference to subsection 1. But the subsection 3 is, is a separate... Um, is a separate power. Subsection 1 is about a power to um, make provision about restricting transfers of land during the application, while well, there's an application um, process. Subsection 3 is about suspending rights in land. Um, so, for example, possible other rights to buy or preemption rights. And so that is a, a separate power. And then in subsection 3, and then subsection 4 is... Making for providing well, further detail about that. Right, I understand that. Let me just test our mutual understanding of this by asking how many powers you think Section 97N uh, creates for ministers to provide secondary legislation? In practice, I think it provides two powers because it... Um, 
uh, the details about the prescribed period and the prescribed persons, though will have to be set out in regulations, will all fall within regulations made under subsection 1 or subsection 3. And prescribed circumstances in subsection and, uh, 4? Um, that is the same because that, that relates back to regulations made under subsection 3. If I'd be happy to put uh, put this further in writing, if would I, that would be I, of assistance. I, I think I think it would be of assistance to me. The convener will decide if it's of assistance to the committee. But I, but but I think I think it'd be right to flag up. Yes, it's a technical certainly. area, but I think we are going to have to be very satisfied that we understand what we've been told today and what your subsequent right to us. Because at the moment, I think we probably, until we discuss it, remain a little bit uncertain as to the effect of the use of the word prescribed. <coughs> Convener. Thank you. I think if you felt able to set that down, that would be helpful. Certainly. Not Happy least because so. it would absolutely guarantee to yourself that you, you know, and your colleagues that you really have got it. I'm not doubting you. Thank you. Right, that takes us on to Stuart McMillan, please. Thank you, Convener. Uh, section 54.1. Scottish Ministers a power to make further provision by regulations about asset transfer requests. And in terms of the, the government, the government they've explained that the power uh, in this section uh, has been drawn in relatively wide terms uh, in order to allow for flexibility uh, in the making of regulations relating to asset transfer requests. Um, however, the committee we are still seeking some uh, clarity on this particular uh, power. Uh, for example, I mean, it could the power actually be used to, to make any further provision as long as it's about uh, asset transfer requests? Um, I think that's me this again. Um, <coughs> yes, it has been deliberately drawn quite widely to deal with um, asset transfer requests. Um, it's wide in the sense it deals with that part of um, the bill. The, sex, the detail is set out in 54 subsection 2. Uh, provides an indication of the areas where we think um, the provision will mostly be used, which is the manner of request, the procedures to be followed, the information to be included on the request. Um, but 54.2 doesn't provide an exhaustive list. And issues may emerge either during consultation on those regulations or it may emerge during um, the practice in the light of experience. Um, to problems to do with potential problems or issues that may require regulations with, to do with asset transfer regulations as a whole and that's why we think the power might be useful to ensure that flexibility of approach. Um, has uh, any consideration been given to restricting the power uh, in such a way that, uh, that but it still allows for a degree of flexibility? Um, not at the moment, no. We're happy to consider any improvements to the bill that could be made. Um, be because Asset transfers happen at the moment, and we're putting a kind of statutory framework around uh, what asset transfers can do. The way the provisions may be used um, by community transfer bodies themselves, by public sector organisations, issues may arise, and we want to make sure that without having to return to the bill as a whole, we can perhaps deal with some of those problems if they arise during regulations. Mm. I mean, also in terms of the, the asset transfer um, requests, uh, I mean, Scotland is made up of uh, a wide variety of communities. Yeah. So, uh, from what you've said, I think uh, my, my take on what you've said now is that uh, this flexibility is to allow for, whether it's maybe an island community, um, for them to go through a process that, that might be somewhat <coughs> different compared to maybe somewhere in, in maybe like some Glasgow or Edinburgh or, or Dundee. Is that? Am I correct in thinking that? Potentially. I think we would want the process to be as consistent across Scotland as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but there may be instances where different communities um, require different things in order to get that transfer application process going and then into the kind of procedure as defined by the bill. Often those issues, though, are about actually the kind of pre-transfer process where actually um, it's about how they want to set out the business case of how they want to use their asset, how they're going to maintain it, the income streams they might have. And that's probably not the sort of thing we're talking about in the bill. That's probably to do with um, other guidance and other funds that actually might be available to the community transfer body. When you say probably, um, is that an accurate word to use or should it be uh, definitely? It's probably probably at this stage. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Right, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we'll go to, to Richard. Thank Your you, procedures, please. Thank you, Convener. Um, 
My questions relate to um, sections 58.4 and 59.4 of the bill with regard to the, the powers laid out in section 58.3 and 59.3. We've asked you about these um, powers uh, previously in our correspondence with you, and in particular, why it's deemed appropriate for appeals procedures to be left to the discretion of Scottish ministers or local authorities. So could you explain further which aspects of the appeal or review um, that the government considers might be subject to discretion of Scottish ministers or local authorities, <coughs> respectively? Uh, yes, no. Um, the regulations well, are yet to be obviously formulated in terms of exactly what they're contained, but there are powers mm. to make regulations in connection with procedure. And the provisions in this bill, these sections, mirror very closely the provisions which apply in relation to appeals under the planning legislation. So uh, parallels can be drawn there. Mm -hmm. The parallel here uh, is essentially that the process will be set out in the regulations and the discretionary element is really up to the decision maker to decide which of the processes should be applied and how those particular processes apply within the flexibility allowed by the regulations in that particular case. Now, this already works in exactly the same terms for, as I say, all appeals under planning, list of buildings, legislation, and that's the, the model that's been used here. So can you explain why the, the, the Scottish Government, I mean, is it for that reason that um, it believes it's adequate for this to be left to the discretion of ministers or local authorities as opposed to specifying the appeals procedure in subordinate legislation? I mean, the purpose, to put it into a, a more concrete example, would be that uh, is to allow the decision maker who's faced with having to determine the particular appeal or review to uh, choose the decision, uh, the process that they consider best suited to enable them to have the information that they need in front of them to reach a decision. So typically that might be a choice between using a written submissions procedure, which is likely to be set out in the regulations, or a hearings procedure, mm -hmm. which again, there will be process set out in the regulations. Uh, and uh, can you explain why the negative procedure is considered to be appropriate here, given the aspects of appeals and reviews are going to be left to the discretion of ministers or local authorities, and what consideration did you give to use of the affirmative procedure? Uh, the negative procedure is fairly standard in use for this type of uh, procedure of regulation, and certainly all the regulations for planning appeals are done by negative reg resolution. Thank you much. Thank you. Sorry, I think I'm out. Um, as well, we want the process to be as transparent, effective and as efficient as possible. And you talked about fair process for all parties before, and I think this applies to this as well. And forgive me, it isn't specifically here, but are we clear that the appeal process is itself sufficiently disconnected from government to, to satisfy the requirement of itself being fair? The thing that's always worrying is when one party, the government or the, the, the public organisation, uh, is is in any sense involved in the appeal that it perceived to be biased in, at least potentially, in the direction of the public body. Are, are we clear that the process which is here is adequately independent? The It doesn't change that much in that the decision maker will be the authority in the end. The appeal process is to review that um, process about the um, this is the public authority who made the decision in the end. The bill doesn't change that um, who makes the decision in the process. And I, I take it the government's lawyers are confident that is ECHR compliant? Uh, yes, certainly. Uh, we are confident of that. And just as a general observation on this, um, obviously somebody has to meet the uh, appellant body, um, but ECHR compliance in these sort of context is uh, reliant upon the oversight of the uh, courts. So ultimately, it's the powers of the courts to uh, consider the uh, way in which decisions are made that makes the, any of these administrative type decisions uh, ECHR compliant. Yes. John? On that point, convener, I mean, there are a, a far greater assumption of powers to the Scottish ministers throughout this bill, and yet usually these sort of appeals are decided by the Scottish ministers. So unless I'm missing the point, there's an inherent contradiction in there. 
Um, I, I don't see the contradiction. Uh, again, it may be helpful to draw an, a comparison with planning appeals. It's mm. Ministers, obviously, are the final port of call for planning appeals. There's judicial authority to the fact that these are all compliant with the ECHR, and the reason for that is that the courts can have the oversight that's necessary to ensure that those powers are exercised in accordance with uh, law and fair and transparent processes. But the difference in this case potentially is that whereas a planning appeal would only allow somebody to use a land on the presumption that they owned it by the time they wanted to, we're talking here about the ability to expropriate people's land? No, not in the transfer no. section. Uh, no, we're not. Okay. No. Well, would it, would it be fair to say that there's a significant assumption of extra powers to Scottish ministers throughout this bill without apparent justification such as asset transfer, power of compulsory purchase, apparently, and with throughout okay. the bill it appears a reduced level of parliamentary scrutiny. Would that be a fair summary? Yeah. Okay. In terms of the asset transfer um, part, I don't think that's true. Asset transfers can happen at the moment, and they often do. Um, I mean in the generality, where, where previously with things that were um, looked at under affirmative procedures are now to be looked under uh, through negative procedures, and there seems to be a great deal of movement towards that. Um, and therefore, the level of parliamentary scrutiny, to me, and I'm certainly no expert, but the first to admit that, but it appears to be reducing. Would that be a fair comment? I think the question we originally asked on section 58, no, I, I think... I, I'm sorry, I was uh, widening it out into the generality uh, rather than the particular, so I was perhaps too early in my, in my summary of, of, of the points. No, I don't think we do think there is a general reduction in parliamentary scrutiny. And in fact, um, by including statutory process on things like asset transfer requests, there's a, an increased amount of um, scrutiny generally about the process. Okay. Richard? Uh, final uh, quick question. Is regarding the process, um, regarding uh, um, appeals of these decisions, and you talk about ECHR compliance, that this might be ultimately be deemed by the courts. Doesn't strengthen the hand of ministers, local authorities, respectively, if actually they're laid out more clearly in terms of primary legislation, and therefore there's a, a standard uh, um, process which is being followed rather than what potentially seems to be quite an, an ad hoc arrangement. Well, I think the, the, the power to take regulations to set out processes and how appeals and reviews will be conducted. So that will be transparent and set okay. out in the regulations. And the discretionary element, which won't be set out, is really a matter of choice of processes and, okay. and choices within those processes. And it needs to have that flexibility to work efficiently. Okay, thank you. Stuart? Um, I, I just wondered if we might seek officials confirmation about what the difference between affirmative and negative uh, uh, instruments is because it seems to me that the opportunity for scrutiny is the same for both what is different is that a negative instrument can have immediate effect whereas an affirmative instrument requires the consent of parliament before it has effect and then in fact the distinction between the two lies in the period at which it becomes effect and the process by which it may be undone, rather than the parliamentary process around scrutiny. And I just wonder whether I have the wrong end of the stick or the right end of the stick. No, you're absolutely correct. A negative instrument could come into force um, immediately. Um, obviously, there are rules about a 28-day period before it should come into force, which are normally adhered to. Uh, whereas an affirmative order would have to have uh, the approval of Parliament before it could come into force, and how quickly that could happen would be a matter of parliamentary process. And no doubt it could happen quickly and could indeed happen faster than some negative instruments which allow potentially 40 days or more before they come into force. But um, you're correct, correct in your understanding. But, but in essence, there is no difference in the opportunity for scrutiny. Uh, in either case, they both are laid before Parliament. Parliamentary committees... 
consider them and it's a matter for um, members of parliament whether they choose to bring a debate on whether a negative instrument should stand or not. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think that brings us to Margaret McCulloch. Good morning, everyone. Uh, the Scottish Government has previously explained that the power in section 87 allowing ministers to make further provision in relation to the removal of unauthorised buildings from allotment sites as provided for in section 82 is required in order to allow for flexibility. Can you give us more explanation, more detail, the intended purpose of the power in section 87? In particular, can you provide examples of the types of further provision the power in section 87 may be used to make, please? Hello. Um, section 87 permits but does not require Scottish ministers to expand on the detail in the procedure cited in um, section 85 and 86. <clears throat> in terms of flexibility, the current procedure provides for a period of notice to be given from the local authority to the tenant, um, detail the tenant's right to make representations, and then subsequently the local authority to take account of these, and the duty to inform the tenant of that outcome. And the provisions also enable the tenant a right of appeal through the sheriff court. In terms of what these additional powers might be used for, they could be used for adding time frames to those areas which aren't, don't already have them specified. So for example, um, it might detail a time frame in which the local authority might take account of the representations. It might also detail the methods through which those representations by tenants might be made. So it's those types of um, things that we would expect this regulation to, to cover. Right, thank you. Can I ask uh, a question? When the committee wrote to you asking that question, why did you not provide that level of detail initially when you wrote back? Um, I, I can't comment. I, I, I don't know why we, we have failed to provide the extra level of detail, and I can only apologise for that. Okay. Does anybody else know? No. Can anybody else answer that question? No. 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 Okay, thanks. I think maybe there's, there's a point made there. Has that covered everything the committee wants to consider at this stage? I think it has. Can I thank the team very much for your extensive answers and your patience with us. Uh, I shall suspend this meeting for a moment uh, to enable everybody to change places and also to move around, I think.
So let me just get back into my script and this will be will be convene. Thank you very much. Right, agenda item two. Um, no, we're past. Agenda item three, indeed, thank you. Is the Legal Writings Counterparts and Delivery Scotland Bill. We now move on to oral evidence on that. Uh, and I welcome from the Faculty of Advocates, Robert Howey, QC, who's uh, uh, agreed to uh, give us an opening statement. I think it was the faculty who had the most concerns about this among those who provided evidence to us. So I look forward to what you have to say, please, Mr. Howey. Indeed, sir. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I should indicate at the outset that it is, of course, the case that faculty deals with far fewer large international transactions than perhaps are done in some of the larger commercial firms, particularly those which are uh, cross-border English firms which have taken over Scottish ones. Our involvement in the making of contracts tends to be contracts to settle litigations. They're formed on the floor of Parliament House. Everyone is there, and of necessity, the problems to which this bill is directed don't exist. However, we do see litigation about a number of the uh, contracts which are made in Scotland, perhaps those numbered among the larger contracts made in Scotland, for example, large building contracts, dare I mention it, PFI contracts, and, uh, say, commercial shipping or sales of company contracts. And in a number of these, one sees sometimes unhappy consequences. And we rather fear that there is a danger lurking in this bill, not that it may necessarily be a reason for refusing this bill, but perhaps causing dangers that ought to be contemplated by the committee in relation to this bill, which are in danger, perhaps, of being overlooked in view of the uh, desire that is expressed, particularly by a number of the larger commercial firms, that that which uh, is proposed should go through pretty much as proposed. The faculty's main concern is the risk that this form of uh, execution and counterpart, as opposed to a situation in which everyone e um, executes the same document, is a situation which can lead to opportunities for fraud and, more probably for its far more common, just sheer downright error and mistakes, in which, if you have enough people signing enough different copies, the copies aren't actually identical. Somebody thinks that some contract is in, or it's been deleted, or some computer glitch has happened so that somebody thinks something's there and the other side thinks it isn't. And you only find out that people uh, haven't signed up to the same things, or want to maintain they haven't signed up to the same things, when matter comes later before the courts. That's where we tend to see it, and that's where we therefore have reservations. It seems all too easy, for example, if one were to permit execution by the uh, exchange of uh, signed back pages of a contract, as it were, each signed by the particular party who signed it, plus the front page. It's all too easily for the rogue or the fraudster to decide to amend what goes in the middle of the sandwich, which is actually the critical stuff. Once upon a time, one used to be required to execute or at least initial every page. Our forefathers weren't stupid, and there was a reason that one had to do that. Our suggestion is perhaps that human nature hasn't changed all that much in the intervening years, that that risk has entirely gone away. Now, there may, of course, be countervailing advantages, and there are some advantages that we can see in this bill, and we freely concede it. It may save a degree of cost, though we confess we're inclined to be sceptical as to just how much. Most of the contracts which will be made under Scots law will be smaller scale contracts, and they won't be made in Glasgow, and they won't be made in Edinburgh or Aberdeen either. They'll be made in small towns around Scotland, and in such cases, the kind of saving of cost and convenience that's involved, or is proposed is involved, by reference to uh, executing, say, electronically and exchanging counterparts, as opposed to simply having people all come into the office to do it, is, we suspect, limited. We also are inclined to invite the committee to question just how many contracts there will be governed by Scots law to which this legislation will apply at all, in which the uh, 
number of parties involved, as say eight or half a dozen, as has been mentioned in some of the discussion, in as many parts of the world. I'd venture to suggest that there aren't too many contracts, frankly, which are going to be governed by Scots law and in which you're going to have American banks in New York, Japanese banks in Tokyo, underwriters in London, and uh, some uh, seller or purchaser in Edinburgh, with the other one being, let us say, in Berlin. We suspect that it is unlikely that any degree of increase in legal business would be brought to Scotland by this legislation. It's not going to make that great a difference, we suggest, to the decisions of people as to whether or not to make their contracts subject to the law of Scotland or to make them subject to the law of England or anywhere else for that matter. As a general rule, I would suggest, people decide on the contract governing law on the basis of its effects on the substantive matters in the contract rather than the ease or convenience of execution. And if the case is big enough that it's the big, very many multi-million pound transaction that does have all the people in different places, that's the sort of transaction we venture to suggest in which it might be thought that the saving in cost and convenience that's achieved by the counterpart bill is actually so infinitesimal in comparison with the size of the uh, contractual sums at issue that the likelihood is that par the parties will be having their great big settlement meeting somewhere or two settlement meetings somewhere um, in any event because the relative increase in cost is not worth considering. For these reasons, but primarily the one about error and fraud, which is our big concern, we suggest that the um, bill might usefully be um, subject to your consideration with a view to, as we've suggested, one possibility might be that if execution and counterpart and delivery is to proceed, as is proposed, that it might be provided, for example, that only the entire document were to be able to be uh, exchanged around so as to avoid or at least reduce the risk of people slipping things in the middle or finding the risk of finding that through error, which we suggest to be much the more common case, parties haven't actually agreed to the same thing or don't realise they haven't agreed to the same thing uh, in the end. One would not wish to have an increase in the number of cases in which parties come to the court to ask for their documents to be rectified and the first problem is to find out what they've agreed to, never mind what it is they were supposed to have agreed to. Now, these are issues we suggest have to be weighed against undoubted increase in convenience in a number of cases, and some degree of saving in cost, though question mark, we suggest, how much saving in cost, and to how many cases it will actually make any material difference, or there will be any great advantage in bringing in business, at the best we suggest it might slow a bit of the flow of business away from Scots law cases. I hope, sir, that's put in a nutshell what we've said elsewhere at rather greater length. Uh, I think it has, and I'm very grateful. And I think Stuart Stevenson wants to come in on a point of detail first. Uh, I, I just wanted to test uh, the Faculty of Advocates' uh, views. Uh, on the financial size of the issue, because I think I heard a substantial attempt to downplay uh, the, the, the amounts of money that might be involved here. And I just uh, bring to this um, the, the rule of thumb that uh, the UK's clearing banks turn over their net asset value in transactions every three days. And that when I was involved in the as, as a non-banker but a technologist um, in these issues some 15 or 20 years ago, the daily turnover of the Scottish banks could be as much as £100 billion. Pounds. And I just wondered if the Faculty of Advocates have a sense as to what proportion of that uh, traffic of money uh, is under contracts that would be signed but mutually by parties. Um, because it's very clear that that turnover is essentially commercial turnover. It's not the turnover from individuals' wallets, because the amount of notes that the Scottish Bank 
debts issues, and I'm substantially out of date, but 20 years ago was only something like £2 billion. Pounds. And I just wonder what the quantum that uh, is round uh, the transactions that might be covered by the kind of contracts that we are thinking about in relation to this bill. Um, the answer to that, sir, is it's extremely difficult to provide an answer, particularly from a bar such as ours, which, as I indicated, deals very largely in litigation. Uh, we don't have the same degree of chamber practice that obtains in London, for example. And therefore, it's uh, quite wrong that I suggest, suggest that the faculty would have an immediate uh, grasp of exactly how much money is being turned over on given contracts. However, what I do venture to suggest to you is that the very fact that we're not able to say large quantities of this comes across our desks is because, of course, large quantities of the work concern that you're discussing is written under foreign law, English in particular, and will continue to be, I suggest, whether this legislation is passed or not, because the reasons that people choose to uh, have their contracts governed by a given law are, as I say, generally to do with substantive reasons. Uh, it's to do with what it is is the transaction they're trying to carry out. Uh, it's to do with where the people who are involved in funding it, underwriting it, uh, are based. Uh, they all tend to have a familiarity and a concentration, being in London, largely this work, uh, with English law. They use English firms. They have merchant banks who are much more comfortable if they're using the people they know, they recognise, they've dealt with for the last 30 years. And with respect, I rather fear that nothing you do or don't do in connection with this is going to make any very material alteration to that at all. It is therefore um, with a view to that that the suggestion is made that the financial saving which is being contemplated in this case uh, and has been suggested in the questionnaire which appeared from the Finance Committee, I think, is perhaps uh, open to considerable doubt because the number of contracts that one will find being written under Scots law, which anyone would take to uh, use this, will be small, and that given the number of uh, contracts that will be thus uh, created, and the unlikelihood that they're going to be at a level at which this would make any material difference, we would suggest that it's unlikely that there's going to be any great saving at all over what would be achieved today if parties wanted, for example, to execute a document by round robin through the post. Uh, and again, we suspect that perhaps realistically many of the contracts which will be formed under Scots law and done this way, if they are formed internally in Scotland, particularly if they're in one of the big cities, frankly people will still tend to just take it round to the other chap's office to get him to sign and vice versa. And that will have the advantage to people that um, they are more certain as to exactly what everyone was signing up to. Okay, can, I, can I bring Margaret in next? I think she was... Uh, yes. um, can I ask you, just run this past you, on the question of fraud, is this a possible option that could be considered um, in that the original document is actually sent to the clients but it's protected in that you can't actually add or amend any of the information within that document. And the same as when you read things online and you actually agree to the terms and conditions, there could be that option as well saying that once you've actually read it, you tick it and you agree that it's actually correct. And then the document that the individual actually signs, right, the first, that sheet is actually headed up detailing the document that you've actually got as an attachment to the business you're actually doing and that you've actually read the document and you agree that it's actually correct. Would that do away with any opportunity of people adding or amending the original document? Could that be considered? Uh, I'm sure, madam, anything can be considered that is thought to be uh, likely to reduce the risks of frauds or uh, which I ask you to, to think about as being far more likely, which is just downright error, mistakes, people getting things wrong, people have different copies of drafts at different times. I'm sure that uh, people can bend their minds to methods to trying to reduce 
the risk, and by all means they should. Uh, the concern which faculty had was that uh, if the bill were to pass on terms which would simply allow whether that was the way people operated some of the time or not, but which would allow other things to be done, like the front and back pages was the one we had in mind, that that would be all too unpleasantly open to roguery. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, one could try to find methods which electronically or otherwise will reduce that risk. The rogues, of course, will try to find ways around it, and we, that's just the way of the world, and we have to accept that that is the case. Uh, the question which we suggest to the committee they would want to satisfy themselves about was whether they reckoned that they had got legislation which reduced insofar as they could that risk relative to whatever advantage the committee thought they could get in terms of time, convenience or anything else uh, out of the bill. I don't think with respect it's for the faculty to sit and say, well, you should do this this way or that that way because there are other people with greater technological knowledge, for example, who would know whether things were or were not secure than do we, and uh, there are others uh, who would have uh, more immediate involvement in direct drafting of things who might be able to say uh, matters were more uh, readily capable of fixed than do we. We, uh, it has to be admitted, have a somewhat skewed view of the world in that it only crosses the desks of persons like me if it's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. So we all tend to uh, be storm petrels. We immediately say, but what about this risk, that risk, and the next thing? And what happens if these people uh, do this or that? And I freely accept that that means that we may have a skewed view of the world because we don't see the hundred that go perfectly well. We see the one that goes wrong. Mm -hmm. But the trouble is, for the one that goes wrong, the damage could be very considerable and you'll want to see what you can do to try to reduce mm -hmm. the risk that that one does go wrong. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Good morning, sir. Um, notwithstanding your skewed view of the world, um, given that error and fraud are the Faculty of Advocates' principal concerns and we are likely to proceed, notwithstanding your reservations, uh, what improvements from your perspective, or the Faculty of Advocates' perspective, can you suggest to the legislation that we are proposing? The one we suggested, sir, was that um, if one is to uh, proceed in this manner, one should require that in relation to the delivery, deliveries have to relate to the entire document concerned, or perhaps that you uh, require that if this is to be done so as to provide immediate effect of uh, contracts, i.e. that they should come into effect at a precise immediate moment that you can more readily identify. This is one of the advantages that's proposed for this. So you can say that it came into effect at such and such a date, that it should then have to be followed up by the uh, full postal versions, that the full original goes through the post so that somebody has at least the opportunity to identify, for example, the error, which, again, I apologise, I'm repeating myself, we suggest will be far more common than, than fraud, but errors are much more common happen and they then get picked up and corrected and that would be a great deal cheaper than having it picked up and corrected when everyone has fallen out for other reasons and it all ends up in the court of session when it takes a lot longer and costs a great deal more to sort it. That's the suggestion we had offered as to something that, that could be done in that direction. It may be that others who have more immediate um, involvement in current practice in doing these things than the big commercial firms who have perhaps experienced these problems in a number of occasions which they've been able to be sorted out and therefore they don't come across the desks of persons like me may be able to assist you with. Uh, again, because of our skewed view of the world, we see the ones that have gone wrong, perhaps badly wrong, and therefore tend to suggest the um, uh, stronger remedies because we see the more ill patients, if I may borrow that metaphor. And of course, we do have the opportunity to hear from some of those other organisations' representatives later on, which is uh, very helpful. I think Mike McKenzie's next. Thank you. No, um, I was interested in your use of uh, the, the sandwich analogy, um, and I, I think it's probably a pretty good analogy, in, in as much as if I order a sandwich and a steak sandwich, and it's 
um, I ask for it to be rare, but I get it back and it's well done. That, 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 that would fall under the description, I think, of an error. Whereas if I order a steak sandwich and pay for it and I end up with a spam sandwich, then that would be fraud. Um, <laughs> and um, given that, given the, you know, the impetus for this um, piece of legislation arises from the benefits that we accrue as a society through our technology, um, can you perhaps cast your imagination into the direction that would look to that same technology to provide safeguards against both errors, which we know happen already, otherwise you wouldn't have any work to deal with, and fraud. And again, if there was no fraudulent uh, practice, then again, I would respectfully suggest you may find yourself out of work. So are there ways that that same technology can be used to prevent these kind of problems that we experience in any case? Um, there are those uh, who would smile having heard you ask me of all people that question and suggest you'd ask the very last man in the world you should have asked about it. Um, but the, but the, uh, I'm very reluctant to get involved in saying, yes, we suggest this, that's the next thing, because frankly, it's not our business of the necessary technological know-how as to how that would be achieved, if it can be achieved. There are others better qualified in those matters who could give you better and more useful answers about what technology you could use or not use that would enable one to protect oneself from alterations and changes and whether or not that can be uh, got round readily or otherwise. That, with respect, seems to me to be a question about um, computer technology better directed in other directions. As opposed to uh, fraud, the trouble ultimately with fraud is that fraud is a deliberate, it's a crime of deliberate intention. And if people are going to do that, they're going to set out to get round whatever protection you've put in, uh, in order to do so. The question is how difficult you can make it for them. And uh, as I indicated uh, to your colleague, Mr. Scott, a moment or two ago, we present one uh, suggestion uh, that can be put forward in that direction. Uh, one can perhaps add on the tweak of if one is going to have uh, the ability to uh, execute and counterpart, then the originals have to follow up so that one can find the errors and spot them more quickly and more cheaply than otherwise one would do. But uh, I should have thought that uh, one wants to try to secure that the drafting of the legislation is such that it reflects whatever evidence you get about the degree to which technology will protect you and how you can protect the cases which are not going to be done technologically because uh, one has to allow for the fact that if the legislation allows simply that one can execute in counterpart, there will be those who will execute in hard copy in counterpart and will, as I say, present the, the front and back pages. Uh, I tend to use on such occasions the example of BAMF as, look, if a contract is made in BAMF, what's going to happen if, because that's not where you're going to get the large uh, big contracts with a big uh, technological uh, background or with uh, large scale organisations uh, contracting. And it's perhaps unfair on BAMF, and I should indicate that I'm not particularly making any accusation against BAMF. I just take it as an example of a, a small Scottish town which nonetheless will have some degree of contractual work in it. And the legislation, if I may suggest it, has to be able to cope not merely with the kind of large-scale deal which the big commercial firms, which were in your, or the Law Commission's original consultation list and no doubt give evidence to you, are going to discuss, but you also have to allow for the fact your legislation will be used by people on, as it were, much more low-level contracting work. And there, too, you've got to have made sure that in protecting and thinking about the top slice of the work in Glasgow and Edinburgh and the stuff that's been done with London or elsewhere, one doesn't overlook the ability of this to be used in smaller-scale transactions elsewhere where they're not necessarily operating in, on the technology basis at all and asking oneself, if that is being done, are we satisfied that we haven't opened the door here to another new potential raft of uh, errors uh, and contracts getting into difficulty because they were uh, executed in what seemed to be the simplest and cheapest method available, because that's what people will tend ultimately to adopt on that argument, 
and that we've opened the door to more troubles that we come to regret. And what can we do about trying to put that right? We've made one suggestion. I don't venture to suggest that there aren't others or others that will commend themselves to you as being better. What I do commend to you is that, of course, you think about um, is this a problem sufficiently grave to justify making alterations to the legislation, and if so, what, in an attempt to try to uh, reduce that risk? Thank you. No okay. questions. Uh, I, I, I think the, the member for Banff might want to comment. Uh, I, I was just going to make the comment that to choose Banff is perhaps particularly unfortunate, as it is the specialist court for fishing cases. Uh, an industry with a turnover of some 460 million a year. And if one looks at some of the uh, recent fines that have been levied in the pelagic sector, which were in seven figures, it's perhaps not quite as small as its position between Donoch and Glasgow might otherwise suggest. And who does shipping cases, I know what you mean. <laughs> right. uh, did, did you want to... Sorry, did you want to come in on this? Sure. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning. Um, I listened carefully to what you had to say just regarding the, uh, the economic uh, aspects uh, of, the, of the bill uh, and uh, what it may or may not offer. Um, but the, um, in terms of the, uh, where Scotland currently sits, uh, if this bill were to, uh, were to pass through the parliamentary process and become an act of parliament in either this shape or, uh, or amended, um, surely this would actually give, uh, would actually take Scotland onto a, uh, onto a different platform as compared to where we currently are. Uh, not whether uh, the large transactions do come to Scotland or not. Uh, that would then be up to the uh, of those who actually operate within uh, within Scotland uh, to certainly promote their skills, promote their their services. But if we don't actually have this particular piece of legislation, then that would certainly take away the opportunity uh, for, uh, for further work to actually come to Scotland, I would suggest. Would that be a correct assumption? It's a, it's a possibility, but I suspect rather an unlikely one, as I've said already, and I apologise for repeating myself. Mm. I venture the suggestion that people decide the law they want to govern their contract mm. by reference to matters to do with the substantive matter they're dealing with. Mm. How one executes a contract uh, falls, certainly should fall, a very, very, very long way down the list of priorities. It's an also-ran, or should be, because one ought to be thinking, I would suggest, about matters about whether or not the legal background uh, in relation to the area of work one is dealing in is one which is going to be helpful to you. Uh, people are going to be concerned about uh, issues to do with uh, the standard of the court system and where they are, the standard uh, dispute resolution. They're going to be interested in uh, matters such as uh, whether or not it's going to cause them needless difficulties with choice of law, conflicts of law problems relating to other bits of their transaction, if it's a big international one with bits that are governed by New York law or uh, English law or whatever. Frequently a reason for not using Scottish law is just it's easier to put everything into the same one if you can possibly uh, do that because it just makes it all administratively easier and cheaper. Uh, lots of people will want to pick um, a governing law with which they're familiar. The merchant banks, the underwriters, all these people have uh, dealt with English law for many a long year and they're familiar with it. They don't want to move from it. In some ways it's just inertia, I grant you, and there might be all sorts of um, comments of an unkind variety which uh, lawyers in Scotland would make about it all. We've all suffered at the hands of it. But the reality is that that happens, and I venture the suggestion that whether one passes this legislation or not, it's not really going to have much attractive effect, or I suspect much uh, uh, reason to go elsewhere if you don't pass it in these terms than it does at the moment. Yes, of course, it is possible that there may be some case where it does make the marginal difference. But I venture to the suggestion that that's going to be a very rare case and that the amount of uh, commercial advantage, if one will, of bringing work into Scotland that would be achieved by this is limited. Now, one might say, well, why not do it? Because if there is any advantage, we can't have it now. 
but um, that's of course one of the decisions you have to take. It's one of the things that uh, you're charged with doing. What uh, the faculty suggests is that it is distinctly sceptical about the idea that there is a considerable financial benefit to altering the law relating to <coughs> the execution or delivery of deeds. It's highly unlikely to bring work in, we think, or indeed to dissuade work from doing it, though I read what has been said by others who deal in big value transactions about that, and they'll have a more um, up-to-date knowledge of these and more direct um, involvement with it. But the, the overall view we have is that we're inclined to be sceptical that there is very much of a financial benefit to this at all. Okay, no, thank you. Can I ask a second Please question? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But just on the, uh, on the issue of the, uh, the electronic uh, repository, um, do you have a, a view on the on the likely benefits of uh, setting up the, an electronic document repository uh, maintained by the Registers of Scotland? Uh, the short answer to that is not particularly. We would, however, be of the view that if one is to create a repository, uh, and some of the responses that we saw had been uh, that have been made to you have clearly grasped this, it would obviously be of help if that repository were of some official variety, such as, say, the registers of Scotland. One would want to be able to ensure security of it, confidentiality of it, to make sure that it couldn't be a place where um, those of uh, ill intent could get in and make use of things or alter things electronically. Um, one has read in the newspapers all too unhappy tales recently about unfortunate things happening uh, with um, electronic communications in clouds and what have you. And it is, I should have hoped, uh, likely that the registers of Scotland or some such official governmental organisation, if one is to do this, would be the kind of large place which would have the ability to provide the security and uh, confidence in its confidentiality that I should have thought would be absolutely critical to being able to make that work. Thank you. Um, for that, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, Mr. Howe, whether I could just take you briefly to the original submission from the faculty, which yes. I have in front of me, and I'm hoping you have it, because um, in, at the end of question one of your response, the faculty has two technical observations. Um, and their talks about, <coughs> pardon me, um, documents which are subscribed by parties. And first of all, can I just ensure that the very last sentence, which says this would mean the contract could not be executed in contract, should mean this would mean the contract should not be ex could not be executed in counterpart. That seems an obvious read. Um, but I'm. I'm just wondering if you could expand to me why it is this legislation fails if documents are produced by the parties. I'm, I'm, I'm genuinely confused as to what that point means, please. Um, you actually have the advantage of me in that you have a, a, a version which is uh, different from mine. But um, <coughs> Thank you very much. If you'd excuse me for a moment. Indeed, indeed, no. That's actually the only copy I've got. Never mind. Uh, do I understand, uh, Mr. Don, sir, that you're asking in connection with the um, technical objection, the second part of technical objection A, which is uh, about, amongst other things, construction contracts? Yes. Yes, right. Um, what that is about, sir, is this. 
if uh, one looks at uh, subsection 1, subsection 2, paragraph B, as presently drafted, um, it says a document is executed in counterpart if no part is subscribed by both or all parties. Now, the concern that has arisen here is based uh, largely in relation to uh, construction contracts, but there may well be others to which it applies too, in which you end up with a document which, if you stood it on its end, might stand about that high off the table. And uh, what it does is it includes lots and lots of subsidiary documents. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these documents are very important in themselves and have been executed and may already have been executed by the time you get to the big construction contract. If you yep. imagine a PFI or a development contract which incorporates within it the actual building contract or the specification and base plan for the building contract, the specification and base plan may have been negotiated and agreed in advance and it's all actually signed up and initialed and all the rest of it mm -hmm. before you get to the stage of this yes. uh, big document. Because no part shall be subscribed by all or both of the parties okay. and the specification already is in my hypothetical example, that PFI or development contract, whatever it is, cannot be executed in counterpart because you've provided that a document may be executed in counterpart and you then give the advantages to that, the, the evidential advantages to that later on. But a document is executed in counterpart if no part is executed by all or both parties. Right. So imagine my case. The specification is executed by both parties. Yep. Not noticing this, everybody has done the great new electronic counterpart yep. net result the thing is not properly executed, right. and it's all uh, defective. And in fact, time. it's totally invalid because the, the because the, the the bill in front of us, the act in front of us, actually says you can't do it Correct. specifically. So and, it and will be incompetent. Yeah. One two B, yes. right? That's what that is about. Thank I you. I apologise. That was no. Clear. It's okay. And could I just be clear, simply for the record, that the very last word of section A, the third paragraph up of that sheet, should be executed in counterpart rather than contract. I believe it's quite obvious it should say counterpart here. Yes. I do apologise. Uh, thank you. That does at least put that on the record and we can probably amend Certainly. it on the record. Thank you. Certainly, sir. That, that's fine. Thank you. Um, could I then look at the section just immediately underneath that in your submission, B yes. as we have it, which begins Certainly. section 2.3, imposes a duty, um, because you did seem to make a very interesting point there about a duty being imposed, but absolutely nothing said about um, who might be liable for, for not carrying out that duty. Um, on reflection, does that need to be added to, amended, or does the, the general law of the land actually allow, the law of trust or whatever, allow that to be, to be okay? I believe that the difficulty that um, was being... Uh, canvassed was um, simply uh, this. Well, the first uh, point was, if one looks at two, <coughs> pardon me, section two, subsection five, it does not matter for the purposes of the document having effect whether three uh, applies or not. Right. But three says the person nominated must preserve it for the benefit of the parties. Yep. And it says, well, uh, its effect doesn't depend on that, so why are we saying that the person nominated must, after delivery, hold and preserve it for the benefit of the parties. What does that do? It doesn't affect delivery. So suppose he doesn't, um, and, and uh, we'll assume that this is not because there's a fire in the office or something like that, but, but supposing that he just doesn't, it gets forgotten about, it's thrown out in an office move, something of this order. It clearly doesn't affect the document, uh, the effect of the document in the first place because of five, so we are asking, um, what does three achieve? Why is it there? What advantage is it providing? Um, it may be that what it is there to do is to say that the person who's been uh, nominated uh, as the, um, if he's, say, an agent of one of the parties, is to hold it for the benefit of both, so that he can't be put into a conflict of interest position and told, uh, you are my agent, I want that destroyed, destroy it. Now, if the object of the exercise is to prevent that from being done, then well and good, but 2-3 doesn't seem to sit. And, and it might say it better if it said both parties. Uh, it doesn't change the sense, but it would actually change the, 
the, yes. the, the implication that would be so of certainly, certainly if the object of the exercise is to secure that if, say, as one imagines it frequently will be, it's the sister of one of the parties who's nominated, yep. you want to protect him uh, from a subsequent dispute between the parties and his being put in an impossible position. And you want to say, right, he has to hold it for the benefit of both parties uh, in the legislation so as to give him a statutory duty that protects him against his own client, as it were, when the fallout happens, so that he can't be instructed to destroy it or some such. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you for those observations. Uh, I suspect that's a point to which we might return elsewhere. You may, um, you, you may want to deal with that when we say that it's, you've got to work out what the remedy is for the breach. You're going to have to look to see the effect of whether or not um, the law relating to the duty on solicitors and things is affected by this. Um, you may want in that connection to check there's been a very recent case last week mm -hmm. in the inner house of the Court of Session uh, about the difficulties relating to unhappy frauds and documents being taken or not taken and so forth. So that it indicates that the problem about the solicitor finding himself acting for a client and what are his duties to the other side after they all fall out becomes quite an issue. And right. no doubt you'll want to ask people about that who are perhaps more directly affected by it than I'm Indeed. fortunate enough to be. Thank you very much for, for that advice. Right, I'm looking at colleagues to see if there's anything else that we need to explore in this part of the session. Thank you very much, Mr. Hyde, for your extensive uh, advice to us. Uh, and I'll uh, briefly again suspend to enable the witness panel to change over. Thank you.
Right, if we can reconvene, thank you very much uh, once again. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Robert Rennie and Alistair Wood. Um, Professor Robert Rennie is the Chair of Conveyancing at the University of Glasgow, and Alistair Wood is a member of the Law Society of Scotland Obligations Law Committee. Thank you very much uh, for your presence here, gentlemen. Thank you very much for making sure that you were here to hear the previous evidence, because that saved us having to play it back to you. And I think we'll have many questions on the same subject, and I think it's going to be led by Margaret McCulloch. Um, yes, uh, good morning, or good afternoon. Good morning. Um, you actually heard uh, Mr Howie sort of question the number of contracts that would actually, in Scots law, come into effect with the new electronic system. Um, do you agree with his comment that he didn't feel there would be an increase in business this way, or do you have any other evidence to contradict that? We disagree. Can you tell me how you disagree? Um, we have experience of commercial contracts which start off on the basis that they will be governed by Scots law because um, one of the parties, the main party perhaps, uh, is based in Scotland and the subject matter of the contract uh, is Scottish. And we both have experience of getting to, say, three weeks before the final completion of the contract uh, and when it is suggested that it will in fact be necessary for everybody to convene in one particular place so as to execute the document at one time, we are met with resistance and in a number of cases what simply happens is the clause which says this contract shall be governed by Scots law is changed to this contract will be governed by English law simply to allow uh, the execution of the document by counterpart. Mm -hmm. Now I was surprised in some ways uh, to hear Mr Howie uh, say that this really didn't matter a great deal because not only does it alter um, the law which governs the interpretation of the contract, but it also alters the forum in which any disputes can be litigated. So it takes, uh, if you like, bread and butter out of the faculty of advocates' mouths. Um, so I am quite clear, and I think my colleague is also clear, that there is a significant commercial issue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you want to comment, or are you? No, I, I echo that. I mean, the number of transactions we work on, and the sole reason to change the law it, to English law or to another jurisdiction is the inconvenience of the questions over, you know, creating a valid document when people are based in different countries, different towns, even different offices, late at night, yeah. in the same city, or in the same small town. Yeah. yeah. He also mentioned the fact that he was concerned about maybe the security aspect would be less secure with smaller business, law firms rather than maybe multinationals. Um, would that, do you think that would apply? Because I'm thinking as well that if you've got a certain standard for a large law firm that, that's got multiple branches, then this, the, the checks in place would be the same for a smaller business, just now even what paper-wise, documentation-wise. So where do you understand where he's coming from when he's saying that he's concerned that it's more open to fraud possibly or error for small businesses using the electronic system rather than the paper system? I disagree. Um, I... I worked myself in what would be regarded as a small firm for 30 years before moving to what would now be regarded as a large city outfit. Mm -hmm. and the same checks and balances applied in both, and I am quite confident that a small to medium-sized enterprise legal firm mm -hmm. uh, would be as secure uh, as a large firm. And on the point of fraud, Generally, in 1970, when an Act of Parliament was passed 
to allow ordinary documents in conveyancing to be signed on the last page only, there was a terrible kerfuffle uh, among the legal profession about what was going to happen. My goodness, people will take out the pages in front of the signature, they'll take them out, put in other pages to change the whole sense of the document. The, the, it will be the end of Western civilization as we have known it. Uh, I defy anybody to produce any evidence to the effect that there has been anything like that since 1970. Um, I also make the point that execution in counterpart is a feature of the English jurisdiction and it is a feature of European and American jurisdictions. They seem to have managed uh, to operate it without any substantial increase in fraud. I make a third point and that is the obvious one. Mm -hmm. People will commit fraud no matter what you do, no matter what the process is. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is no bill and no safeguard in a bill that is ever going to prevent f fraud, absolutely. Yeah. I do not consider that this measure uh, increases substantially the risk of fraud in commercial transactions. Okay. And just finally, um, what kind of impact do you think it would have on Scottish property transactions? Because my understanding is that the law doesn't permit parties to change the law of contract to English law. This, this bill is, is intended uh, to apply to what I would call bilateral or multilateral deeds. Mm -hmm. um, property transactions in the sense of conveyances are not bilateral or multilateral. A disposition transferring property from A to B, be that a house or be that a, a, an enormous factory or indeed a retail centre, is signed by one mm -hmm. person. So counterpart does not come into it. Ditto a mortgage document over a house or indeed a, a bank lending document uh, for a commercial lending over a factory is signed only by the borrower. So th there is no effect, this bill will have no effect on ordinary property conveyancing. It will have effect uh, if there is a bilateral mm -hmm. agreement or a multilateral agreement involving two or indeed more parties. Okay, thank you. Any comment, Mr. Wood? No. I'm not an expert in property law, so I'll defer to the professor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Good. Uh, just to tie that one off, would it be fair to say that uh, many of the property transactions that commercial uh, companies may undertake are actually about purchasing the company that controls the property? Because, of course, there's a process that, for example, delivers control over a property without um, affecting what's in the registers of Scotland and, of course, probably avoids things like stamp duty. So, therefore, in, in the larger transactions, there may well be instances uh, where the provisions that are before us here may well matter when de facto it is about transferring control over property, if not necessarily legal ownership. Yes, correct. Um, for, for company transactions where a, a single purpose vehicle may own yep. a property, it will enable those contracts to be entered into um, by uh, you know, two parties in different locations. The same goes for a company, though, that the transfer of those shares would require a stock transfer form, which yep. again is a single unilateral party deed. Right, John. Good morning, Professor Rennie. Mr. Howey suggested that it would, in his view, be more important that the law of the country was more important than the convenience of the signing. Is that a position that you, oh, self-evidently you don't agree with? But given 
the differences between Scots law and English law, I find it, I incline to his view, forgive me, rather than yours, that that is a reasonable position for major deals to consider which legislation they would rather work in than, and particularly given the increase in de devolved powers, rather than the convenience of signing in counterpart or inconvenience. I don't, I don't disagree with that. I think there will be cases where um, one of the parties will want to have uh, a particular jurisdiction. Um, but what I'm talking about is the, the technical aspect of it, where the parties have already agreed that it's Scots law, because you're, you're, you're six months down the road with your negotiation and it's going to be Scots law from day one until three weeks before, when all of a sudden the parties say, look, this is a terrible, this is a terrible inconvenience for us all to come up, uh, to get it all signed here. So can we just make it English law after all? It's not going to make that much of a difference, is it? So I am I, 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 to hear that. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't. my naivety, probably yeah, I, 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 I mean, than anything else. Alistair will probably have more experience of this than I do, but it is a factor. I canvassed it with my own corporate department before I came, and they confirmed that that has happened to them on a number of occasions. Your suggestion, if you forgive me, being so impertinent, was that this was the norm rather than that it has happened on a number of occasions, um, which would suggest it's well, not it, the it, norm. No, it, it doesn't. I'm not suggesting it happens in every... If it happened in every occasion, you wouldn't be bothered putting Scots law in the agreement at the start. <laughs> um, but in some occasions, that is what happens. And, and why shouldn't we... Why shouldn't we be as up-to-date, if you like, actual, electronically, as other jurisdictions? I, I, I see no particular reason uh, for saying, why don't we just stay where we are? Uh, if other jurisdictions uh, think it's commercially good and legally safe, uh, are we the only jurisdiction that... Uh, has a monopoly of legal truth. <laughs> I suspect we could discuss that for some time. <laughs> <laughs> Do colleagues have any other questions, Stuart? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Just as uh, I pose the question uh, to uh, Mr. Howie earlier on regarding the electronic repository. Um, do you have any, any views on the likely benefits of setting up an electronic document repository maintained mm. by the registers of Scotland? I suppose, really, that's a matter for the registers of Scotland, who I think are giving evidence here next week. Um, there are, of course, uh, registers at the moment. One of the Books of Council and Session is a preservation register, um, although it's not used very much now. And, of course, it is a physical hard copy register, which would not uh, suit. The problem about repositories, of course, is that uh, IT systems change and are updated from time to time, and you would want to be sure, I, I agree with Mr Howe in this regard, you'd want to be sure um, that whatever system was used uh, was never going to be completely outdated so you couldn't access what was there. I mean, they have one in Spain, I gather, where Adobe, it's called Adobe X, and uh, Adobe have guaranteed that it will always be accessible no matter what the changes are. Now, I'm not IT literate to any great extent, so I, I cannot evaluate uh, the worth of that. But um, in due time, uh, a repository might be a good thing, but it, you know, this bill stands on its own. Um, this bill does not depend uh, on having a repository at all, and it, you know, we, we shouldn't sh uh, f get away from the focus of that. But in the longer term, yes. Okay. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I wonder if I might just, uh, before coming to the things I was intending to address, since the subject's come up in relation to the repository, while it may not be necessary for the repository to hold all documents of whatever form, would you be of the view that the algorithms and methods by which electronic signatures are provided to documents wherever they're held could usefully be held in a central repository, thus allowing future generations access to the means to understand and verify documents wherever they're subsequently held? that that would be one of the important things besides the holding of the documents themselves? In the longer term, yes. I, I see no reason not to have something of that nature. I'm not... You're asking the wrong person. I mean, I, I kind of lost the place when you said Alga, whatever it was. Alga, <laughs> I kind of lost... But I get, yes, you're talking about how the d digital signature is, it's fi and is verified, yes. Uh, yeah, do, for, yeah. do forgive me as I spent 30 years in technology, but, but of course I'm somewhat out of date because the 30 years started in the 1960s. Sorry, I cut across. I think that's an interesting concept and it seems to be of historical value as well to be able to maintain the probity of signatures down to the future, so it seems a logical step from the signature to the electronic signature. Well, perhaps that's something you gentlemen may take away to think about uh, while we also uh, think about it. But, but, but moving on more generally to the subject of electronic signatures uh, in, in a whole, I, t I take it uh, you would be of the view uh, that it is helpful if we have a permissive environment that allows electronic signatures uh, and electronic verification of the validity of content of documents to be part of uh, Scots law. Yes. Agree, yeah. That's fine. That's concise and unambiguous. Um, now, the Law Society is developing a smart card and digital signature scheme. Um, I'm not sure the committee <coughs> knows all that much about it. I wonder if it would be possible if either of you are in a position to give us a little more insight into where that stands in the process of development and implementation mm -hmm. without necessarily giving us insight into the mathematical algorithms that it will depend on. Um, the, the position at the moment is digital smart cards are being handed out to members of the profession. I understand, although I'm not directly involved in this, I understand that um, criminal practitioners, and I use the phrase advisedly, <laughs> criminal practitioners are getting the cards first because they will also be used as security passes to enter Her Majesty's penal institutions. Um, and the cards will be uh, handed out uh, as the year progresses. They will be two individual solicitors. Just... We were hoping to have James Ness, who's the Deputy Registrar, along this morning. He's unfortunately not able to come. I suspect that that's an area of expertise which we will now like, like to interrogate somehow or other. We'll, we'll, we'll yes, he would be get, the person to ask. Uh, if we can get Mr Ness along or, or, or written advice on that. So I think that's perhaps for another day. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, Bridget? Uh, briefly, Professor Renner, you, you've talked about, uh, about the fact that you don't see any huge additional uh, risk uh, from these provisions in terms of error or fraud. Um, but regarding uh, the use of pre-signature pages, I wondered if you thought there might be any specific um, risks in relation to um, fraud and errors in terms of using those, um, and do you think that there's sufficient, sufficient protection in legislation as proposed in this area? Yes, I do. Thank okay. you. Fine. Well, I think that answers my question very succinctly, so I don't need to... <laughs> Thank you for that succinct answer. I'm wondering if I might briefly take you gentlemen to the last subject I raised with Mr. Howie. Um, it, part, partly the uh, consideration that if that bundle of papers already contains a document which has been subscribed by the parties, then it appears not to be competent to execute it in counterpart, which is clearly not, I think, what anybody would have intended. Did that strike a chord with you, mm. or... Is there an immediate fix? That is not my interpretation. Right. Um, my interpretation of the section is that it relates to the document which is to be executed, which is the main document. Mm -hmm. 
what Mr Howe was referring to was the possibility that there might be annexed to the main document another subsidiary agreement, say a building contract. This is, let's say, this is a big development contract mm -hmm. involving developers and different people and funders and whoever. And annexed to it are a series of other subsidiary agreements which, because the parties are proximate, uh, have simply been signed by both in the normal way. That is an annexation to the main document which is being signed in counterpart. The section refers to the document which is being signed in counterpart. It does not refer to any annexation. I do not therefore accept the interpretation as given. That's very helpful. Thank you. Stuart? Um, just may I, in my non-legal ignorance, seek clarity as to what an annex looks like. Now, I'll just give a context to my question because I've, for my grave misfortune, had to be involved in a lot of these in my previous life uh, and indeed had to travel to other continents to sign things with other people. Um, often commercial contracts will be a contract with many schedules which are separately signed and may describe and be expected to be changed during the, con the course of the, the contract. For example, what equipment might be delivered or what so on and so forth. Are those what you are describing as annexes or is an annex in the legal terms, which I'm sure you're using, mean something different? No, it is exactly the same. An annexation is simply something that is out with the body of the agreement but referred to in it. So an annexation could be a plan, it could be yep. a list of parts for a machine, Yep. It could be a list of employees. Yep. It could be a copy a building contract yep. already signed. Yep. You name it. Right. So it's exactly as I'm familiar that with. That is so. Yes. And indeed, the schedules in most commercial contracts to which I've been party are substantially bigger in aggregate than the contract itself. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. OK. That makes perfectly good sense. Um, could I also just pick up on the issue of Section 2.3, a person so nominated must, after taking delivery of a counterpart, hold and preserve it for the benefit of the, uh, uh, of the parties. That seemed to be a suggestion that solicitors would normally be holding this agreement once it had been executed. Um, you will have heard our previous discussion about whether that's both parties and, and the question, what's that for? Does that subsection give you any concerns at all? Not really. Section 2.3 yes. is a technical section, really. It is designed to cover the situation where a single person holds a document, <coughs> but for the benefit of both or all the parties to that document. It is designed to make it clear that, let us say it is party A's solicitor who is the nominated person, to hold. Party A acts, so that solicitor acts for Party A. It is designed to prevent Party A going to the nominated solicitor and saying, you've got that document, you act for me, I'm not happy now. Tear it up. Mm -hmm. The, the, the solicitor for Party A cannot do that because he is not holding in and he or she is not holding in, in the capacity of a solicitor. They are holding in the capacity of somebody for all the parties. That's why it's there. And it's sufficiently it's sufficiently accurate to say that. Yes. Yes, I think it is. I'm I'm, I'm not doubting it. I wanted your your thoughts. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, just in relation to that, uh, I'm familiar with the use of escrow in certain other contexts. Is, is it the generality that in this case it would require the agreement of the two parties as to instructions that are given to the person who's holding the document? Is that the way it generally works? Yes, Section 2.1 says parties, plural, to a document in counterpart may nominate, so all the parties to the document must agree to nominate a particular person. And, and to any subsequent changes yes. in the nature of the nomination. Yes. Yeah. That's right. 
Okay. Thank you, gentlemen. I think that completes our questions. Are there any other issues that you think we should have covered and haven't asked you about? No, this is a very useful bill. I agree, it's a very useful bill oh, and very you. useful okay. for Scottish law. C could I just observe that if something does occur to you in the next day or two or few that, and you want to uh, write to us about it, that would, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for your uh, uh, responses. And again, just briefly suspend to enable the, uh, the witnesses to change over. Thank you. Okay, all right, I think if we can reconvene, thank you very much. Uh, if I can welcome Paul Halley, who's a partner in finance and restructuring at Shepherd and Wedderburn, Wedderburn apologies. Colin McNeil, who's the corporate partner, partner at Dixon Minto WS, and Dr. Hamish Patrick, who's a partner at Banking and Finance team at Todd's Murray. Thank you very much for coming along, gentlemen. Thank you for your patience in waiting. Um, and I'm really wondering who wants to fire straight in. I'm wondering whether Margaret McCurrick might like to come straight back in on the same basis as she did yeah. with the Law Society. Thank yeah, you. I'm more than happy to do so. Um, can you, we've already asked these questions to other uh, witnesses as well, but it'd be quite useful to hear from yourself. And can you give me examples of difficulties that your organisation, maybe yourselves, have actually experienced with the inability to sign contracts and get everyone together? and the advantages from yourself if you went down the electronic route as well. Right, if I can, yep. I can perhaps come in and in interest, since I think uh, my name is plastered all over the Scottish Law Commission report as somebody who suggested we do this in the first place, and, and Colin and Hamish will be able to support. I mean, I think, I think there's been a lot of talk about will this bring work into Scotland, and, and I think the evidence from the Law Society earlier about the way in which contracts are now conducted is very pertinent. I think Colin and Hamish and I have all sat around boardroom tables in the last 20 to 25 years um, and the nearer to today that happens the, the more disparate the parties are to sign those contracts where yes if you are selling a Scottish company the, lo the logical law that should govern that contract is Scots law uh, but time and time again we will uh, change that to English law because we will have four or five parties. The director may be on holiday. Um, he may be sunshining in the Cayman Islands, and he, the last thing he wants to do is turn up in a wet Drich, Glasgow, to sign the contract, which may sell, despite the fact that it's selling his company for millions of pounds or whatever. So I think, um, and I think the points made by the Law Society are very valid in that, whilst this bill may not bring work into Scotland in terms of people choosing Scots law, there have been 
uh, endless times over the last 20, 25 years when I have, my, pa my partners have, and I'm sure Colin and Hamish have, changed the law of England, uh, changed the law of Scotland to the law of England precisely for the reasons that were outlined by the Law Society. Um, and I think um, it is now, it, when I started the law in the law 20, 25 years ago, yes, we got to the end of a transaction and all the parties met around the table and we all signed up the documents and we signed them in duplicate and it all happened. Uh, increasingly, uh, parties getting together to sign contracts at the end of transaction, no matter what that type of transaction, never now happens. Mm -hmm. And in, under English law, it never happens. And, and you have to have a legal system that can facilitate the way in which businesses and, and companies want to do business. Yeah. Could I add, um, my firm was involved, and it's a useful example because I think everything pointed in this particular transaction to Scots law. It was a fairly large Scottish company, but which had operations north and south of the border. It was refinancing its bank facilities with Scottish banks. The head offices and registered offices of both of all the parties concerned were in Scotland. And yet, at the last minute, for the reasons that Professor Rennie explained, the choice of law was changed from Scotland to England. Be not because a minor inconvenience or a minor travelling cost for the parties to get to one place. The costs of travel are insignificant. It's the fact that the, you've got very many busy, busy people for whom to take a day or half a day out of their, their lives to get to one single solicitor's office is just, uh, it, it's, it's not something that we could contemplate asking them. Uh, and that, that gets multiplied when you've got parties that are further around um, or outside of Scotland and, and other places. So in that case, it was a, an example of a contract. Let's hope litigation never transpires on it. But if it does, the Faculty of Advocates will have lost that business. Mm -hmm. Um, the question, there's a few questions on the back of your answers. Um, how confident were these businesses to transfer from Scots law to English law, taking into account the security aspect of the electronic signatures? Uh, utterly confident. Yeah. Um, these businesses transact under both jurisdictions mm -hmm. all the time. And I think the, the benefit of this is that English law and Scots law in very, very many, uh, in all, almost all respects, are the same mm -hmm. for your average commercial transactor. Yeah. Um, so it, it was no difficulty for them, and certainly no difficulty in doing it electronically, because that, uh, as Professor Rennie said, that's what happens. And mm -hmm. for most of us, I'm sure Hamish and, and Paul as well, we do th contracts under English law and w w they get done electronically and have done um, under a recognised procedure under English law for a number of years now. Yeah. I mean, Mr Howie did actually question the number of contracts that would actually convert from Scots law to English law. Can you give me an example, even say a rough ballpark figure over the past year, how many contracts your organisation converted from Scots law to English law for the reason of getting electronic sign signatures? Well, we, we sometimes do it with... Uh, with... Uh, um, sure. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me, mm -hmm. with, uh, <laughs> we, see, we see the issues arising in relation to um, uh, um, uh, uh, documents and obligations that um, cannot be written under another law and what happens is you then move the move the asset as it were to a different jurisdiction things that have to be under under scots law that are such a pain to do under scots law they'll say well it's not worth it mm -hmm. or we'll move this bank account to england instead because it's easier to do it that way mm -hmm. um, or we'll exclude these assets from this multi-jurisdictional transaction these scot the scottish element of this transaction because it's too much of a pain and i should say that i spend quite a lot of my time um, apologising for the inadequacies of Scots law. Just to give an example, um, if you have a, 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 a multi-jurisdictional financing transaction with, uh, with assets in, in England, uh, various European countries, uh, the US or whatever, um, they will all sign their documents in counterpart. They will all be there'll be people in the US, they'll be all over the place, and they will all do them electronically in counterpart, and they will do them in advance. They will have a signing date several days before the closing date. They will do them all in advance, and I will say to them, sorry, we can't do that, 
First of all, we're going to have to have separate Scottish documents that operate differently. Then we're going to have to work out how we get our footwork right so that they work. And it's actually not uncommon for us to have to get signatories out again um, on the day of completion to sign a series of documents in a specific order um, uh, to comply with the, the requirements of Scots law as to counterpart or as to or as to delivery. Uh, delivery is a, a big uh, and yeah. es escrow is a big is a big issue there. So this will make um, it will put some of my junior lawyers <laughs> some of my junior lawyers' lives a lot easier because they will not have to jump through all of these hoops and we will look a little bit less embarrassed mm -hmm. uh, in in those situations where we frankly, appear backward mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, when, we're, when we're trying to do this, and we have to do it. And but do you have a percentage of your work over the year that for ease of business and efficiency, you choose the English model rather than the Scottish model? And if so, can you give me a rough percentage of that business? I don't know. I'm not sure if I would have those figures, but I would say that um, where we now operate is the way, if you're writing contracts these days and you know that it is highly unlikely that the parties will come together to sign, then the predominant motive will be to choose English law rather than Scots law. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, and I think it's not, it's not about how many documents or whatever else, it's actually about fitness for purpose of Scots mm -hmm. law against, against the expectation of the global community. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. uh, we will all advise on English contracts as well as Scots contracts, mm -hmm. which are from the point of the start of the transaction, properly English contracts. So it's quite difficult to put, a, put, to put a percentage on it. It's not an insignificant one if you look back the last 20-odd um, uh, years uh, uh, that, that Paul's been talking about. It, it's not an insignificant percentage. There's another angle in this as well, actually, and that is that in, in some more systematised situations, people will choose English law for convenience. Um, uh, there are some situations where they can't for consumer mm -hmm. protection reasons or whatever, but for example, um, uh, vehicle leasing. Um, vehicle leases are very often written under English law. One reason for doing that is because it's easier to execute them. Mm -hmm. if, you've, if you've set up your, 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 your... Now, there are other reasons why you may want to use the one law in your business if you're operating throughout the UK or, or, or whatever, but it certainly something that may tip the balance for people who operate uh, operate systems uh, uh, to, to originate contracts of one sort or another, is the convenience of that system. When looked at as a whole, it saves them large amounts of money. Now, if their origination system does not require people to, to, to sign things, send them back, get them back, actually, I think of a mundane one. My son has just moved into halls of residence at university. He's to sign a, a lease, or, uh, and I have as well. Um, he had to download it. He had to download two copies, sign those two copies, send them to the residence, and when he got to the residence, he picked up one of them that had been countersigned. It would have been very much easier for him to download one, sign it, scan it, email it, they countersign it, they send it back mm -hmm. again. And that works in England. Yeah. Um, now, with, a, with, a, with a, that sort of contract, it has to be under Scots law, so they, mm -hmm. they, they have to do it that way. But if this is a vehicle lease, um, <laughs> why wouldn't you write it under English law to get that sort of um, um, systematic convenience? Mm -hmm. and, and just, if I can just position that, just as an example, since he's used that example, during the summer I was in, um, on holiday in, in uh, South Carolina. My son is at London School of Economics, uh, and... He woke me up one morning and said, Dad, we've got two hours to sign the contract for the lease. And on a system called DocuSign, which is an electronic uh, document system, the landlords sent us the lease and the guarantee that I have to sign for the lease. Um, and all three parties, because there's three tenants, three guarantors, signed up using an electronic system. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not an advanced si signature system. It is just simply an electronic system that people are using for commerce in England for leases. And, and that's just an example of the sorts of things that are already happening yeah. and Scots laws to keep up with it. Two very, very quick questions to fi finish off. So do you feel your business want, if you had the option of using electronic signatures, would all be under then Scottish law? You wouldn't then have to go into English law? I think electronic signatures are perhaps a separate point, mm -hmm. but if the bill were passed to allow counterparts, yeah then it would take out that percentage of contracts that, which otherwise would be Scots law, yeah. but that changed to English law. And so it would make a difference in that respect. Yeah. Okay. 
And finally, how long has the bill been in practice in England? Do, does anybody know? It's not a bill in England. There, there was a case that drew attention to the problems of electronic delivery and signing in 2008. Uh, and in 2009 or thereabouts, the Law Society in England and various other bodies agreed a number of approaches mm -hmm. that practitioners could use to yeah. ensure certainty. And those are uh, one, the, 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 one of those approaches is almost universally used. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if it's working in England, do you see any reason why it shouldn't work as efficiently in Scotland? No. And at the moment, we try and make it work in England, I, I, there have been some discussion in the in the in the in the papers about whether or not um, uh, emailing a PDF to sign unilateral document counts as delivery. Yeah. Um, we do it. Um, uh, um, uh, um, whether or not we will be sued at some point <laughs> as, as a result of this, uh, um, uh, I don't know. Practice varies in this, and I, I'm, I'm sure sure you guys you guys have as well. But uh, we do these sorts of things. In all, we take multilateral documents and turn them into unilateral documents, so we can do this sort of mm -hmm. thing. It makes things much more complicated in other respects, but we do it so that this can fit in with what people are trying to do. And yes, we, we, we see these we see these emails from the south and say, well. How do we make our how do we make our system fit in with that? Yeah, you know, just because yeah. it's there in England and operating doesn't mean you've got to have it. <laughs> but yeah. uh, but uh, what you want is your system to to operate effectively with the other systems with which it's interacting. Okay, thank you very much. And whether in the first instance, Rich would like to see the issue of fraud? Yes, uh, absolutely. Thank you, convener. Um, obviously, you've heard the the faculty raise its concerns about issues regarding fraud and. Error. Can I ask what firms do currently to mitigate against um, a potential fraud and error, and whether you think, or to what extent, that will change uh, once signing and counterpart is possible? I think if we take the example of a simple bilateral contract um, negotiated between two parties, each of which have their, their law firms, um, even though they might be very close to one another, Geographically, they, there, there may be no reason to meet throughout the whole transaction. Mm -hmm. All the documents get transferred in Word format by email mm -hmm. until they are agreed. And then when they are agreed and the final version is agreed and signed off by both sides as being the final version, um, and this is, this is following the best practice in England, mm -hmm. um, the, the, um, one, part, one firm would convert that to a PDF. Mm -hmm. Now, if you, uh, if at that point, if you're going to a physical completion meeting, mm -hmm. then you print it off in however many copies you need and you take it to the meeting and it gets signed. If it's done electronically, the, that solicitor will send that PDF, which of course cannot be changed, round all the parties. And that's the one that they will then agree that's to be signed. So you see no material difference in what firms will have to do in effect? No. There have been specific concerns raised uh, regarding the use of um, pre-signed signature pages, which I think relates to that case, perhaps you were referring to earlier yes. on in the change of um, rules to, uh, down <coughs> south. Now, do you think that there's sufficient um, protection? Um, Professor uh, Rennie was very adamant on this point that there was, but are you also satisfied that the legislation has sufficient protections in regards to potential fraud in relation to pre-signed signature pages? It's very unusual to use pre-signed signature pages. Yeah, so um, it's a big I, issue. I, 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 would, I would, I would be very reluctant in practice to do so, say very right. exceptionally. And then, and then, what, what, what you would do? I mean, this is this is from the perspective of a, of an advised transaction, um, where, where there are lawyers involved. That uh, um, um, I would ensure I had a very clear trail of authorizations indicating. To what to, to the approval yeah. of the document to which this has been attached? I would want an email with the PDF saying you can attach this page to this document mm -hmm. uh, because, from my own personal perspective, um, as the person who would be doing the attaching, <laughs> I would be I would I would want to ensure it was uh, and I would want to know why you had to do it that way as well. Mm -hmm. So you think a lot of responsibility for that working effectively would actually fall on firms themselves and practitioners themselves, rather than being the effect of what's in the legislation? I, I, I suspect in, in, at, a, at a practical level, yes. Okay. I think the, the, the purpose of the bill, though, is not to permit pre-signature of contracts. Mm -hmm. And I think in the 
in the process of, of, of the Law Commission's work, they looked into whether that would be a desirable aspect of law reform in this area. For my firm's part, we didn't think it would be because I, I think there are more concerns over pre-signature, pre, sorry, pre-signed pages that, than, than it helps. Mm -hmm. um, there are other ways to get around someone's inability to sign once the document has been agreed. Thank you. Just as a wee test. Um, fraud and error. Is it possible for uh, companies in Scotland to get insurance to cover that particular risk? And do they? I don't think I know the answer to that one. <laughs> I, I suspect it, it's not possible. Uh, uh, other than general fraud by employees uh, mm -hmm. and, and that companies will have, but fraud on the part of... Um, an officer entering into a transaction, or perhaps worse, to contemplate their advisor, um, it may well be difficult to insure against. I don't think they consciously do so. I'm not sure whether, Paul, you would think it was covered by commercial <coughs> insurance. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know. I, I just, I, and I don't think it enters into people's conception. I mean, I think, it, again, I think we need to be careful about what we're looking at here. Um, for commercial parties to make a contract, Many contracts don't need to be reduced to writing. So a lot of what mm -hmm. this is about mm -hmm. are going to be contracts which are actually facilitated by lawyers and therefore there is a huge degree of uh, probity in the system already by the fact that you have lawyers on either side. I have heard concerns about this being used by parties themselves. Um, and yes, that could happen under this bill. But at the moment, a lot of the, part, a lot of the contracts that ordinary parties would be doing without legal advice at the moment they can do at the moment. They don't need to be reduced to writing. I could agree with you tomorrow to buy mm. your company mm. um, and we could do that verbally and shake hands and that would be a binding contract. Um, so I, you know, I, I, I just don't get the fraud concerns around all of this. It, I was only asking yeah. the question to see if someone external to the profession had done a risk assessment. That, no, that was no. my only reason for asking. But equally, I can see that it may well be that it would be cheaper to self-insure. You know, to carry the risk on your own boots. And, and, and I think, again, we need to look at the bill as being facilitative. And, and, and people will use this bill to do, use counterpart execution and will follow the steps in it. And sometimes they may sign the last page and use those provisions. Mm. Sometimes they might actually choose to actually ask for the whole document to be sent through. I think, you know, we're, I mean, solicitors are... I think there was, um, and I think the other thing that is of comfort in all this is I think you've heard evidence from the lost site in England, and there's simply no no evidence I think of um, the practice there, which comes from the common law, um, being abused, open to fraud. And what we've tried to do here is build on the policy statements in England and actually make it even better. Um, yep, yeah, that's fine. I didn't want to make a meal of that particularly. Uh, by the way, I, I hope you're not relying solely on PDFs, but secure PDFs, because I certainly have software that enables me to edit PDFs, which I do for my own reasons. Um, ele ele electronic signatures, how, how widespread is the use of that currently, and is enough in the bill to allow electronic signatures to be used as widely as the profession might find useful? Not used at all. In uh, everywhere the world over, uses um, pen and paper, whatever jurisdiction you're in. Uh, in. In the contracts that I certainly get involved in, and, and I suspect for Paul and Hamish too. I I perhaps just ask that I, for my sins, was the one of the project managers for the CHAP system, which of course introduced electronic signatures thirty-two years ago. That just make that passing observation, that's all. Well, and, and that's a good example of something that was innovative at the time and has yeah. become commonplace. And, and who knows, in 32 years' time, we'll be looking like the dinosaurs. But we, we are reflecting what our clients do. Uh, yeah. And I, I suppose overlying the chaps will be something with the signature on it under which the account has been opened, under which the... No. The, 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 no. Um, Not even in 1982 yeah. when we went live. Believe me. Can I bring John in? Point at the end of the question, if I may. Uh, by all means, if you'd prefer to leave it. Is, do, does Stuart mind? Yeah. yeah, please do. 
Uh, good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Uh, I've just been looking through your submissions um, again, um, so also <coughs> after the evidence we've heard from the, the previous two panels. Uh, and just uh, there's a word that's come up uh, in the submission from uh, Shepherd and Wedderburn and Todd's Murray uh, was the word antiquated uh, regarding the current uh, system uh, in which we work. Uh, and the, um, in the f two of the initial bullet points raised uh, in the submission from Dixon Minto uh, stated uh, there are no disadvantages to the approach taken in the bill and the bill is comprehensive and we do not believe that uh, there are any missing provisions. So certainly from that, uh, Dixon Minto, you, your position is uh, very clear, um, but in terms of uh, um, Shepherd and Wedderburn and Todd's Murray, I'd just like to get it on the record if possible. Um, uh, if you agree with uh, the, the comments from Dixon Minto, and uh, do you think, uh, do you believe that, uh, that the bill as it currently stands is, uh, is accurate, or do you think there are any missing provisions? Happy to support Mr. McNeil and Dixon Minto in, in the clarity of their submission to you. Yeah, well, as as am, as am I. I think it was it was gone into in in, uh, in great detail by the the, the law commission uh, before it before it came here. Yeah, I anticipated that. So that's what you were going to say. So, which, uh, uh, but uh, a, se a second question, just on something uh, different. Uh, I pose this question to the previous two uh, panels as well. And that was regarding the the situation uh, for an electronic repository. Uh, and um, do you do you believe that, it, that that there are that there will be any benefits uh, to the setting up of an electronic document repository maintained by the registers of Scotland? Uh, I'm, I'll go. I'll go first. I'm not sure it's my area of expertise, mm -hmm. um, uh, but I um, and I think it's separate. As been said before, I think sure. it's separate from this Act. I think this Act facilitates moving towards that. Um, I think uh, because we are transacting very often cross-border when this happens, any form of depository <coughs> would therefore need to gain um, a degree of universal, uh, universal acceptance. Um, and the Register of Scotland or someone may be able to provide that. Um, I, I don't know. Um, but in the same way, and, and such a register might be able to become universally accepted and, and very helpful from that point of view in the same way as we were talking about chaps earlier on. Um, so um, yes, that is, I, I would imagine that's a possibility, but I don't have the technical knowledge to know how that would work. I, I think I would just agree with Paul that in cross-border transactions, it's perhaps difficult to see um, how and why registers of Scotland might have a role. But that also, it, it presupposes that Electronic, uh, an electronic repository is uh, accepted anyway. Um, and I think probably in the areas in which the three of us work, that's not the case at the moment. Okay. Yes, and very often the, the law firms have their own in a sense, uh, uh, and, and clearly they will operate in parallel. I, I, I can certainly see the advantages of having a central one rather like we have the books of council and session, but whether it's, a, whether it's an answer to to, uh, to, to everyone's problems uh, um, is, to my mind, another matter. Sure. Useful, okay. I think, but not everything. Sure. Okay, thank you. John. Thank you. And further to Stuart McMillan's uh, question, gentlemen, as lay people, notwithstanding uh, Stuart Stevenson's uh, obvious expertise in this area, albeit historic, but nonetheless, we have to take the advice of experts such as yourselves. And Mr Howey raised concerns about the proposed legislation, which you and Professor Rennie um, discount and disagree with. Are there any reservations you have about this proposed legislation? And it appears you have none. But are, are you inviting us, therefore, to discount and dismiss uh, Mr Howey's concerns? Or is there any of his concerns that you would support and uphold? Well, maybe if I can go first, I had the benefit of sitting through all of his evidence, and his first concern was the one of fraud or error, or fraud and error. I, I suspect we've covered that. His second was he wasn't sure how many contracts this would affect. Um, I think we've covered that, that it's, it's difficult to put a percentage on it, but nonetheless, there is, a, there is a percentage of contracts that we all come across that this would affect, and that if they remained under Scots law, would get the would have the benefit, if litigation arose, of being litigated in Scotland. Um, 
he didn't think that the, this bill would influence the choice of law. And I think we've demonstrated in the other evidence that that isn't the case, that whilst there are often very clear factors determining where the choice of law is, between Scotland and England, when you've got parties that, that, that are, um, operate throughout the UK, uh, it comes down to the often mundane matters as the convenience of execution. So it does affect, uh, it will influence the choice of law. Um, and he finally said that in large multi-party international deals, cost isn't an issue. And I think um, it, it's travelling cost, as I said earlier, is not an issue. But the, the time cost of these uh, of clients is an issue. And they don't, they're not in a position to travel to Edinburgh or Glasgow or wherever uh, from their own offices. Because, uh, as we indicated, very, very often whole transactions... Um, can get covered uh, involving billions of pounds without people leaving their offices. Uh, and that is a common feature of, of commercial life just now. So I, I don't feel that any of the concerns he had raised are valid, uh, um, but others may have other, thing, other, other things to add. Others will speak for themselves, doubtless. Yes, I don't think I've really got much to add to what Colin said. I'm shaking my head in disbelief, I think, through all of his evidence, I'm afraid. <laughs> Just, um, I, I understood the concerns, but I, I don't agree with them in practice, and I think uh, I, I just, I just incomprehensible that you wouldn't introduce this, you wouldn't introduce an act like this, and put us on a level playing field. If, if I may just add, he did suggest that one protection might be that the bill required that the, the whole of the document be sent back electronically as a, a counter to error or fraud. Um, I was certainly party to a discussion with the Law Commission when, when this was being formulated. And our concern over that was that, um, using Paul's example when he was on holiday, if it, instead of being a short, I don't know how long his document was, but if it had been um, a, a hundred page document, if you're on holiday or, or even sitting at home with your home printer, it's a gross inconvenience at two in the morning to ask a director of a company to print off 100 pages and then re-scan them all back. Um, whereas printing off a single signature page uh, to get the deal done is, is not an inconvenience. And if he happens to be somewhere in the world, staying in a hotel, um, you know, trying to find the facilities in that hotel, even if it's a five-star hotel he happens to be sta staying in, um, you know, at small hours of the morning is just... You know, not what he wants to do, and and he will look at you and say, "Why am I doing under, this under Scots law, and why am I using your legal firm to do this?" And, and it's just you know, it's just uh, positively disincentive to using Scots law. Thank you. Well, that's certainly clear cut. Thank you. I think that completes our questions. Can I thank you again, gentlemen, for being here? Can I particularly thank Mr. McNeil for arriving very early because the fact that you did hear all the previous evidence is very much appreciated and helpful to us. So that is, I'm grateful for that. And I will briefly suspend the meeting once again to allow the witnesses to leave us. Thank you. So, um, good, good to see you, colleagues. <laughs>
Yeah, we do need a bugle for the legal advisors because it's really not fair to, to suddenly find we've got a question and they can't, they aren't here. Um, sorry about that. We can do. I think I've got to do all the instruments. Right, uh, let's reconvene at agenda item four, which is instrument subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Bankruptcy and Debt Advice Scotland Act 2014 Consequential Provisions Order 2014 Draft, nor on the Bankruptcy Money Advice and Deduction from Income, etc. Scotland Regulations 2014 Draft, nor on the Common Financial Tool, etc. Scotland Regulations 2014 Draft, nor on the Dot Arrangement Scheme Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 Draft. The committee may wish to note that the second and fourth of these instruments replace earlier drafts, which were laid before the Parliament on the 21st of August and the 22nd of August, respectively, but were withdrawn by the Scottish Government following correspondence with our legal advisers. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Thank you. Agenda item five is instrument subject to negative procedure. The Bankruptcy Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014-225. These regulations contain a couple of minor drafting errors. Regulation 19 refers to section 54. For D, 4B, or 6B, without specifying that these are provisions of the Bankruptcy Scotland Act 1985. Page 27 also contains notes for the completion of Form 4 Statement of Assets and Liabilities contained in Schedule 1, but the page is duplicated with page 26. The Scottish Government has undertaken to correct these errors by means of amending regulations, which would be laid before the Parliament before these regulations come into force on the 1st of April 2015. There has also been a failure to feral to follow normal drafting practice as various provisions in the notes within the forms in Schedule 1 are not drafted in gender-neutral gender terms. The supplies at pages 34, 37, 39, 41, 124 at paragraph 3 and 127 at paragraph 3 of the regulations. The Scottish Government has again undertaken to correct these provisions if and when other amendments to the relevant forms in Schedule 1 are to be made or if in the future the regulations were to be revoked and the relevant provisions re-enacted. However, the committee may consider that the various non-gender neutral references should be amended at the same time as the mining drafting errors I previously referred to, and so before these regulations come into force on the 1st of April. Does the committee agree to draw these attentions to, sorry, these regulations to the attention of the Parliament under the general reporting ground? Agreed. And does the committee also agree to recommend that the provisions are drafted in non-gender neutral sorry, which are drafted in non-gender neutral terms should be corrected prior to the regulations coming into force. We do. Thank you. Furthermore, the meaning of the saving provision in paragraph A of regulation 24.1 could be clearer. 
there could be a consistent use of tense in subparagraphs 1 and 2. Paragraph A could accordingly have been clearer that it applies to sequestrations proceeding either on a petition for sequestration, sequestration presented on or at or on a debtor application made before the 1st of April 2015, regardless of whether the date of presentation of the petition or the date of making the debtor application was before, on or after the date of making these regulations. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the, report, the Parliament on the reporting ground H, as the meaning of the saving provision in paragraph A of regulation 24.1 could be clearer? That will be amended then. The, the, the difference in tenses or not. I'm, I'm unclear in my own mind. I think we're asking the government to consider that it should. Yes. And right. I think we're telling them that we're, it should. We're seeking that they do. Because I'm sure the committee would like me to reiterate that we would prefer subordinate legislation said what it means and means what it says. Absolutely. Every time. Thank you. The Scottish Government has indicated that it may not have been consistent to use Sorry, it may have been more consistent to have used is instead of was in Regulation 24.1A2, but it is not indicated that revision will be amended. However, previous comment stands. Does the committee agree to recommend that Regulation 24.1 should be amended at the same time as the previously referred to minor errors are corrected to provide better clarity and consistency of provision? We do. Thank you. The Bankruptcy Fees Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014 there has been, could be a consistent use of tense in subparagraphs A and B. Regulation 13.1 could accordingly have been clearer that it applies to sequestrations proceeding either on a petition for a sequestration presented or on a debtor application made before the 1st of April 2015, regardless of whether the date of presentation of the petition or the date of making the debtor application was before, on, or after the date of making these regulations. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on reporting ground H as the meaning of the saving provision in Regulation 13.1 could be clearer? The Local Government Pension Scheme Transitional Provisions and Savings Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014 233 Regulation 1713A1 specifies a condition when membership of the Local Government Pension Scheme for the purposes of calculation of a survivor pension payable in accordance with the requirements of, of Regulation 1710 to 12 shall include additional membership under certain provisions of the 1998 or 2009 schemes. Specified condition is that a surviving spouse or civil partner was married or in a civil partnership at any time whilst the deceased was in active membership of the scheme after the 31st of March 1972. This should also provide that the spouse or civil partner was married or in a partnership with to the deceased member of the scheme, which isn't actually specified. Does the committee therefore agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the Parliament on the reporting ground I, as the drafting of the regulation 1713A1 appears to be defective? Okay. Two minor drafting errors have also been raised by our legal advisers in relation to this instrument. Firstly, in regulation 1.4, there is an error in the definition of the 1998 traditional transitional regulations as the citation of the regulations is incorrect. The words Scotland and transitional provisions are inverted. Secondly, in regulation 1713A, the reference to regulation 41A to D of the 1998 regulations should be to regulation 41.4A to D of those regulations. The committee may wish to note that the Scottish Government has undertaken to lay an amending instrument to correct these errors timiously for these before these regulations come into force. Whilst noting this undertaking, does the committee agree to draw the regulations to the attention of the pol Parliament on the general reporting ground as they contain minor drafting errors? Okay. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Bankruptcy Applications and Decisions Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014, 226, nor on the Homeless Persons Unsuitable Accommodation Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014, 243. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Okay. Instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure, the rules of the Scottish Land Court Order 2014, SSI 2014, 229, 
This instrument contains some minor drafting errors. Firstly, the reference in Rule 21 to the rights conferred by paragraphs 2 and 5 of this rule should be to the rights conferred by paragraphs 2 and 6. Secondly, Rule 51 refers to the process in the case under Rule 49. The reference should be to the process in the application, as that is the term defined by Rule 49. And finally, the reference in Rule 97.3 to a written submission under Paragraph 1 of that rule should be to a written submission under Paragraph 2. There has also been a failure to follow normal drafting practice, as various provisions in the order are not drafted in gender-neutral terms. This applies in Rules 7.1, 58.4, and 106.4 in the Schedule to the Order. Given the matters I have highlighted, does the Committee agree to draw the instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground? Okay. Separate of the Committee may also wish to note that it would have been useful had the plain Tamp planned timing of this instrument allowed a period longer than two sitting days between the date when it was laid before Parliament and the date when the provisions were brought into force to afford the Committee the opportunity to scrutinise the instrument before the commencement date. The Committee may also wish to note the explanation of the timetable given by the Scottish Land Court and the Court regrets the inadvertent failure to allow the time for scrutiny. Do members have any comments, please? No. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on public bodies. Joint Working Scotland Act 2014, Commencement Number 2, Order 2014, SSI 2014, 231, nor on the Act of a Journal Amendment of the Criminal Procedure Scotland Act 1995 and the Criminal Procedure Rules 1996, Miscellaneous 2014, SSI 2014, 242. Is the Committee content with these instruments, please? Before we move on from consideration of instruments, the committee may wish to note that a total of 39 minor points have been de identified in instruments under consideration today. While the error, although those errors are minor, the committee may nevertheless consider such a high number of mistakes to be unsatisfactory. Do you members have any comments on that? Or shall we merely note it and uh, pass on at this point? That brings us to agenda item 7, which is the Criminal Justice and Courts Bill, which is UK Parliament legislation. Under this item, the Committee is invited to consider the powers to be made to make subordinate legislation conferred on the Scottish Ministers in this Bill. A briefing paper has been provided that sets out the relevant aspects of the Bill and comments on the effect. Does the Committee agree to report to the League Committee that it is content with the delegated powers conferred on Scottish Ministers in this Bill and with the procedure to which they are subject? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Gender. Stuart, sir. Um, <coughs> it might just be useful to draw the attention of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to this being another instance where something touching on subordinate legislation is not accompanied with a delegated powers memorandum mm -hmm. as part of the SPPA's consideration of the legislative process. Thank you for that comment. <laughs> Agenda item 8 is deregulation bill, which again is UK Parliament legislation. <coughs> Under this item, the committee is invited to consider the proposed powers to make subordinate legislation conferred on Scottish ministers in this bill. Apart from one clause <coughs> that is already in the text of the bill, the clauses which will introduce these new and extended powers are contained in an amendment which is, will be considered at the committee stage in the House of Lords on the 21st of October 2014. A briefing paper has been provided that sets out the relevant aspects of the bill and comments on their effects. Does the committee agree to report to the League Committee that it is content with the proposed delegated powers conferred on Scottish ministers in the bill and with the procedure to which they will be subject? Great. Thank you. <coughs> At that point, uh, we mention agenda item 9 and I move the meeting into private. <coughs> <coughs>